Hey everybody, welcome back to The Beard and the Bald. I am Paul Shirey, The Beard, joined by my compatriot, The Bald. And we have a very, very awesome special show today. So, Chris, how are you doing? To, how, are you, how are you today? How's your... Uh, I'm how's fine. Life? Paul's just auditioning new guest hosts to take over for me. <laughs> now, we do have a, a special uh, guest that's going to join us a little bit. Um, I'm not going to tell you who it is yet. I'll wait till we, uh, till we get to that point. A relatively big star in the online like journalist community, though. I yeah. Would say. Like yeah, a well sure. known A well-known figure, for sure. I yes. Would... You have probably seen this person um, out and about. If you follow any kind of uh, film blogger types, you've certainly pr- probably a good chance you know who this person is. But um, I'm going to save that surprise till we get to it, because first thing we're going to talk about today um, is a little film called The Art of Self-Defense, starring Jesse Eisenberg. And Chris, uh, if you listen to the podcast regularly, uh, had a chance to interview him last week. And I don't know. You said it went really well, right, Chris? You guys had you guys had you had a chat. He wanted to know a lot about you. Yeah, he was. He ended up up being a great guy. You know, it was. I mean, one of the things that always helps, though, when you do an interview. First, it was in person, and two, it was a very casual setting. Right? He was in Montreal, and it was very relaxed. There were a lot of people around with like cameras and stuff like that that were getting ready to film him. But I'm just there, sitting in like a Depeche Mode T-shirt with like my phone to record us on. Right. And it was very casual, and I think he was kind of relieved by that. Like, I think he was kind of happy to be off camera and just get a chance to kind of kick back. So he was very, yeah. he was very, he was very happy to see me, and he was very happy to talk to me as well. But I think what really made the difference is I think he could tell how much I genuinely liked the film because I really, I actually loved the art of self defense. I thought it was great. You never I, know. I did too. I yeah. loved it. Yeah, you never know with these kind of movies, right? And, but I liked that director's um, last movie, uh, Faults. Uh, Riley Stearns. And uh, there's, I mean, there's an interesting story about Riley Stearns. Like, I don't like to go into people's um, personal lives too much, but, you know, he was married to Mary Elizabeth Winstead for years and, and, right. and, they, and they broke up recently. And he kind of talked on his, on his, um, on his Facebook. And I even kind of mentioned this to Eisenberg, who was, who was, who, who thought it was interesting. Uh, I didn't mention, you know, what the circumstances were, but he kind of talked on his Instagram because I followed him for a few years because I really liked Faults and I liked the short movie he did called Cubs. And he was talking about how he kind of spiraled into a depression, but then really found his footing again by doing jujitsu, right? And by getting into physical activity and physical and martial arts and stuff like that. And I, and I could really relate to that because that was something when I was growing up mm, kind of saved my yeah. life. And now I find that I've really kind of gotten back into doing physical stuff as well, like boxing and, and weightlifting. And I really do find that it's, you know, it's an olive branch when you're having a hard time. You know, it's something that's really kind of been therapeutic for me. But I didn't get what kind of movie it was going to be going in, though. Did like, you I start thought... listening to metal and get a German Shepherd no. and speak German to it? <laughs> no. <laughs> but you, this that won't make sense unless you see the movie. But, uh, <laughs> but, 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 but anyway, but... You know, going into the movie, I didn't know what to expect because the trailers made it look like kind of a straight comedy, right? Yeah, and like I, kind of a quirky, goofy movie. Yeah, I thought it was going to be like Karate Kid, right? And you know, and it was yeah, you know, I yeah, I kind of felt that too. Yeah. But it's not. It's it's like Fight Club, but maybe even darker. Like it gets crazy, <laughs> violent and crazy dark. But I loved the movie. Like I had an amazing time watching it. And um, and Eisenberg, I think, could tell because I was I had a lot of questions prepared about the movie and the themes and stuff like that. And he was, you know, he was impressed when we were doing interviews. Like, oh, wow, you really liked it. You really got into it. But he said something very interesting. So, Paul, you you liked the movie a lot. Let me ask you, when you were watching it, did you see it as a comedy or did you see it more as a drama? Like when you were watching it, what was your reaction to the movie? Were you laughing a lot or were you like, yeah, I was laughing. I was laughing a lot. Um, And actually, my kid started watching it about 20 (laughs) minutes in. Mm-hmm. Um, like he came in and he loved it too. So yeah, this yeah. is a 10 year old, a 10 year old. He, he loved it. No, and my, um, girl, my girlfriend loved it too. Yeah. Really, really liked it. So, you know, we were watching it and honestly, I really didn't expect a lot. I thought if anything, it would just be kind of like quirky fun. Yeah. But while I was watching it, like I was laughing out loud, but I wasn't laughing so much because it was like comedically funny. I was laughing because of like the stuff that was happening was like this, the stuff that was happening was so like crazy. Yeah. You know, I was just like, oh, my God, like, what the fuck? You yeah. know, so it was that's why that's me, why I like it. It's a like Fight Club meets Heather's. It was uh, a lot like Heather's, but with, with but, Karate Kid mashed in there. Yeah. Well, we were watching it when we were watching it. We were laughing a lot during the first like half hour or so, but we never really saw it as a comedy. And when it was over, I was like, oh, that was dark. You know, I was it was almost more of like a taxi driver. Yeah. 
to me. And he said during the interview that he thought that was interesting because he said that when he's talked to people that have watched it on their own, they've absorbed it more as not necessarily a drama, but as this kind of fucked up movie. But he said if you watch it with an audience, like at South by or something like that, they're laughing all the way through and it and it really goes down as a comedy because he said it makes people nervous, right? Laughing at a movie like that. And they almost they don't know how to absorb it. So they absorb it as if it's a comedy. Anyway, this is yeah. all the this is all in the interview. Uh, I, I tried to keep it really spoiler free because I really want people to go out and see the movie because I think it's I think it's a great movie and it's actually getting a pretty good release from Bleecker Street. Um, I think it's the last kind of it's very rare that a movie like this gets an actual theatrical release and I hope people will go yeah. check it out. But it, anyway, it really it's... feels like an indie like that too. Like oh, where yeah. it's not like you know something like oh my god this is going theatrical nobody's gonna see it. But yeah. that's why I think like even if it's like not a success at the box office, this is a movie that's primed for cult oh, status yeah. at some yeah. point. And even Eisenberg kind of acknowledged this in the interview. Like he didn't necessarily know if it was gonna be you know a box office hit, but he thought like it would be a real cult movie. And and he said that you know if that was the, this is the kind of the movie the kind of movie that he really likes to make. It's the kind of movie that he enjoys, right? More yeah. so than, than some other things, you know, and he was really engaged by the movie and he was doing a lot of publicity for it, even, you know, coming to Montreal. Um, so anyway, here's the interview. Let's play the interview. And then Paul, let's discuss the movie a little bit afterwards. Sounds good. We go. So I saw the movie this weekend oh, cool. and I actually loved it. I thought it was Thanks. great. I watched, it, I watched it with my girlfriend. She was horrified, but she also loved it. This is what I've heard. The yeah. stuff with the dog was like, she had to stop it and like... <sighs> this is what I've heard. Yeah. <laughs> but, but it was amazing. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I really liked about the movie and I wanted to ask you about is that it's set in the 1990s, yeah, yeah. which I thought was actually kind of interesting because I remember I grew up in the 90s the, the big thing then was the martial arts superstar, right? Like Van Damme and Seagal and kind of this masculine ideal that the movie deconstructs. I just wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about that, how this notion of the ultra male hero yeah. is kind of totally deconstructed in the movie. Yeah, exactly. Um, and you, well, okay, you're semi-correct, but it was like, I think he intended to set it like in a non-time, but it yeah. looks exactly, you're exactly right that it looks like early 90s and yeah. in my, I think what happened was like in America I assume Canada as well yeah um, the karate kid came out yeah. and after that there was this like um, there was this um, there was like um, a trend of opening these um, karate classes in the suburbs because yeah. all American kids wanted to do it including me when I was six years old I did them too you did yeah. them too so it's the same in Canada I guess um, they were called um, they were referred to as McDojo's <laughs> like McDonald's because they were popping up <laughs> everywhere and they were like a kind of sanitized version of martial arts right yeah and so like um, wait I lost my place because what was it oh yeah so you're saying oh yeah and so anyway so I think like um, it coincided then like with the culture that you're talking about where like the movies and pop culture emphasized like guys that were hyper masculine mm -hmm. Schwarzenegger and uh, Van Damme and the kind of like ideals of masculinity were like um, brute strength and uh, and violence no and, empathy and no empathy exactly <laughs> right of course like a Terminator yeah. Yeah. right and so like um, and so like my um, I think my so so the so this movie is like a kind of satire on like um, on that notion of masculinity, but also on like cultural touchstones like the Karate Kid. Like it takes the premise of like a timid guy who needs to gain strength from um, a sport, but then it turns it on its head. The sport is actually a cult, and the leaders of the sport are not uh, benevolent and uh, you know striving for the best of the class. They're actually sociopathic narcissists. So like it takes and it becomes genuinely violent, not like not like sweetly violent in the nature of a character no. kind of overcomes them. Right, so it's like, it actually like, I think it like takes the kind of like sports movie genre and twists it to become a brilliant satire on modern masculinity. I, it's funny because I used to talk to, to Riley sometimes on Twitter because I really liked oh, really? the last movie he did, False. Yeah. I thought it was great. Yeah. And um, I reviewed it at Fantasia and we kind of talked a little bit on oh, Twitter. Oh, it played at Fantasia as well? Yeah, yeah, it was oh. great. And this is playing at Fantasia. I know, unfortunately, yeah. we're doing the, it comes out that week in New York, so we're like stuck in doing press. Oh, the audience is going to go crazy for Shit, it. I know, it's exactly, the festival. I know, I know. Exactly the right audience. I know. Um, but it's funny, I follow him on Instagram and he talks he talks about how jujitsu for him has been like a thing that's really kind of helped him through some bad times. And I mean, I can relate because I used to do karate and stuff like that, and there was a good side to these things. But at the same time, like you said, there was a really negative side too. I, I remember once doing a, a story for, for school where I had to interview this guy around a dojo and he was like Alessandro Nivola's character in the movie, like completely like 
stuck in the 90s he had a mullet yeah. and the way that he would talk was like a cult master really right um i was just That's wondering really so you, you mentioned that you did it when you were six years old <laughs> did you ever find that you kind of got like swept up in something like that especially i imagine hollywood is something where a lot of movements are a big thing yeah 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 did you ever find that there was like some kind of tendency for people to get pulled towards those things and why does that happen Oh, well... Um, and not specifically just Hollywood, but just in general, I guess. Yeah, I mean, Riley, is, as you know from, like, Faults, is very interested yeah. in, like, cults. Oh, yeah. And I think, it's, I think it has something to do with Riley's own earnestness. Yeah. He's so sincere, mm -hmm. um, unusually sincere, especially for somebody who makes movies that are funny. Like, he's unusually sincere, and I think he assumes that everybody else is going to be sincere as well. So I think he's interested in cult behavior because it takes sincerity and manipulates it. Yeah. It says, you know, you can be a better person if you come and join mm -hmm. our group, but it manipulates it, and I think, something, I think that terrifies him as somebody who is very trusting of other people. And I think that's probably why he's interested in cults and why this movie has, like, a cult-like element to it. But he also, like, in terms of, like, um, I never, oh, no, I never got swept up in that stuff. I mean, I went to I went to high school, like, two blocks from a Scientology center. Oh, wow. And I used to just go there, like, anthropologically to kind of just <laughs> to look, you know, and talk to the people. And they gave me, like, these stress tests and stuff. We have, like, one here, I think. Oh, you do? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in America, obviously, there's yeah. several. And, um, and so I, I just went out of curiosity to these, you know, because it was kind of funny to go to them. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they take... Like, they're, yeah, I mean, because they're so sincere about something that to me seems so foreign, you know, and so yeah. odd. Um, and, uh, but no, I never got, like, swept up in any of that stuff because I come from a suspicious Jewish family, which is to say, like, we're, we're already part of a group. Like, you know, uh, Jews don't really join cults like that. You know, we already are from a tight-knit group that feels alienated. Mm -hmm. So, like, I think it's unlikely that we, like, would join some other sect. Um not to compare Judaism to a cult because it's no, not. No, no, of course. But like, you know, I think because you you already feel like part of a community, you know. Um, so I think that's probably why. Uh, yeah, that's why, probably why. Um, yeah. And I think like the, um, like the nature of like karate, I like only studied, like I only, I did like a three week intensive thing for this movie. And the first thing I was told by Mindy Kelly, who's the fight coordinator for this movie, is that I have to stop talking. And um, as you know from meeting me, it's probably <laughs> no, quite it's difficult. Cool, huh? um, like you too. No, you're like, a good conversationalist. Yes, you too. <laughs> right. So, so like that was difficult. And I think that is like, that's like the first thing that happens in a cult anyway, is, mm -hmm. you know, you have to stop talking and listen to me. And so like, in a way, I guess it was like the guy you met, like, you know, you're like, you have to s suppress your own desire to you know be part of the conversation it was weird because like in the movie the things that he was saying were absolute nonsense but he had a huge following and it was just yeah. and how does this happen where there's smart people that are following and that's the thing with the movie too they're all they're not stupid I people I know. You know especially your character he's a smart guy he can learn German in two weeks yes exactly <laughs> I know I know yeah, yeah exactly yeah I think it's like the idea that like Smart people without confidence yeah. are still susceptible. Are still are still susceptible to stupid people with confidence. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could look at that in politics. You could look at that, you know, in every aspect of society. There's smart people with confidence that are still susceptible to stupid people with confidence, and it says to me that confidence is somehow more important for leadership than intelligence. Yeah. All, not all the time, of course, but that's but but it's possible to be. Yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's unfortunate, you know. One of the other things I wanted to mention, uh, so I was, I, I saw the movie actually before I saw any of the trailers because I had read the reviews at South by and and everybody really loved it and I knew I was gonna like it because I like faults and um, and I watched the movie and I was curious because somebody wrote on my Facebook wall oh it looks hilarious yeah and I was like it was funny but it wasn't like ha ha funny necessarily at times and and then I watched the trailer and the trailer really does kind of market it as a comedy yeah but do you think that's kind of speaks more to the fact that. It gets, it's it's a good bait and switch because when it happens you're like oh shit you know? yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And, and, but also I think it's rare that a movie like this gets made and gets a theatrical release like it's getting from Bleecker Street I feel like this is something now I could only see on streaming because you think it's like too obscure a tone it's not that it's too obscure a tone I think the tone is, is perfectly uh, commercial and I think oh. the audience will like it but the problem is that Hollywood likes to pack everything in a neat little box these days yeah right? yeah yeah you know it's like the shelf of a video store where you see this is comedy this is drama I don't yeah. know where this one goes it kind of goes in between and I like that and I think that's what everybody the Joe Blow audience would like too but is it a challenge to get a movie like this made these days it must be I assume did you watch the, you watch the movie alone with your girlfriend yes so what I've noticed like um, when it plays in crowds, yeah, I, there it's 
it plays like a raucous comedy. Yeah. And so I think because we were kind of watching it like we were we were we were afraid that you got to, that everybody was going to get killed and stuff like that. Right. It was almost like Taxi Driver when I was watching it, but yeah. I loved it. It's interesting that you experienced it that way. That might also speak to like because you're so film literate based on your work and interests. I think when there's like an audience of like like an average audience, mm -hmm. I think it's partly nervous laughter because um, they're not exactly sure. Whereas yeah. you're used to seeing things like that, so you're kind of like maybe ahead of it or something. I don't know. It's the strangest thing. It's like I meet people like you who are like really film literate and who like understand this stuff, and like you're used to seeing like stuff like that, and you know it can go to a dark place. Mm -hmm. I think for like the average audience, I think they're not like ready for it. You know what I mean? I think that's partly why like you're saying like with the trailer, like it looks like a comedy, and then people are thrown off. You well, know? I think in a, in a pleasant way though. Like I mean, I do think it's gonna be. Like, I, I do think word of mouth is going to be really good on the movie, though. Yeah, I agree. I agree, because people feel like... I, just, I also have noticed, like, people feel like... People feel like they got it and no one else did. Yeah. Like, I just did a movie... I just did an interview with Joanne Vrakas. Do you know her? No. She does, like, the morning breakfast show here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Global. Yeah, yeah, and sure. I, I was talking Kim to her. Was she does not seem like the target audience for the movie, but she was talking to me as though, like, she was the only one on Earth who, like, got it. And it made me... Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. It made me realize, like, the way... Like, when I first read the movie, I thought... Well, it's strange that you're saying this, good, but like when I first saw the movie, I thought I read when I first read it, I thought it was the funniest thing I'd ever read. Like the dialogue, I was crying with laughter. But then when you're acting in it and it goes to these dark places, you realize that it's like darker than the script might imply, just by virtue of there being blood and not being blood in the script. And so, but I think people like take it as the like it was made for them. Even somebody like Joanne Vrakas, who's like not our target demographic. No. Yeah. And probably not my girlfriend either. Um, right. One thing I wanted to ask you, so you've done all kinds of movies, you do big budget movies, and you do kind of, I would assume, smaller budget movies yeah. like this too, oh, yeah. right? And it's kind of a balancing act, but you've always done it really well. You could do Zombieland 2, then you could do this, yeah, yeah. you can go back and forth. Um, do you think that the era, though, of them spending $100 million on a movie like The Social Network is over? Do you think that that will well, ever happen again, unless it's somebody like Fincher, I guess? I don't know. My finger's quite, like, far off the pulse of this stuff, I guess. Um, because I don't really see that much. Like I think. Well, first of all, that movie was not like a hundred million dollars, and so I. I mean, it 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 was successful, but it were like while we were making it, it seemed kind of like a smaller, intimate movie. Yeah. Um, because it was made without like movie stars, and because it was like about people talking in rooms, there was sure. not much action and stuff. Even though the selling point of it was a website, you know, well, it grossed a hundred million. I think. Oh, sorry. In terms yeah. of stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, in terms of like you were saying about like Bleecker Street re releasing this in this way, and like that, we're fortunate to have that because it's more rare. But I think like because this movie is so strange and it yeah. is what it it's so what it is and doesn't try to kind of um, adhere to a certain genre. I think that like works to its advantage, even though it maybe is less. Um, like ca is less able to be categorized, but I think that actually works to its advantage. Like people's reactions to it seem to be to seem to me to like that they appreciate what's special and unusual about it rather than they like it. They like that it adhered to a certain genre. Well, it does feel like the perfect kind of midnight movie too, though. Right? Yeah, I also think there's this other element too, which is that the movie Riley wrote the movie in 2015, but because it's coming out now, it becomes this like really brilliant satire on the absurdity of modern masculinity yeah, and it's God, because yeah. it's it because it's coinciding with conversations we're having as a society about how men should behave well okay sorry, uh, yeah, yeah no, problem. Sorry, yeah. no problem sorry, yeah. oh just also do you think we might see you at tiff for for Zombieland 2 possible I'm hoping oh do you think they would put it there maybe yeah did did they do that midnight madness oh yeah for sure so they don't do they do big movies oh of course yeah yeah oh i didn't know that oh i'd love to go i love that festival of course yeah. i'd love to go okay. you go every year oh yeah yeah <laughs> nice meeting you yeah it was great to meet you yeah, take care come here. and that was you know he's he is just uh a, such an interesting compelling guy and i feel like this role I, I think you could say this a lot. He like he plays a great kind of like nebbish type, you know, wimpy character, but not one that's just uniformly wimpy. He's someone no. that's like something is lurking underneath. He's not like, oh, he's just a wuss. It's like, no, he's not a, wuss. a questionable. He's like the wuss that's got like a fucking fire raging inside of him. And you've seen that in multiple other films. Yeah, um, he's, got, he's got an edge to him. Right. And, you know, he's not physically an intimidating person. I mean, he's really thin. And if you see him in, in person, too, but I kind of bought him in this role and I thought he did well in the martial arts. You know, I liked I mean, the fights weren't really elaborate, but they were they they, they were kind of realistic. And that's like kind of what these fights are like in these in these schools. But, man, it got violent at times. Like there were some gore shots in the movie that were nuts. But I mean, I the performances in this movie that were on point. I mean, I thought 
Eisenberg was terrific. I mean, I think I think it's probably one of his best roles. Uh, although, you know, I've liked him in a lot of other movies, though, like Social Network. And I really like Adventureland, which is a movie that I think a lot of people haven't really seen. Um, Imogene Poots was really good, too. I yeah, that was yeah really she was good, good as well. And uh, but the one who really stole the movie for me, though, was Alejandro uh, Nivola. Oh, yeah, he's so good. Len, I always think yeah. of him as <laughs> Caster uh, Troy. Nicholas Cage. Yeah, Caster yeah. Troy, Nicholas Cage's brother from Face Off yeah. is just kind of like this, oh, Caster. You know, and it's like, he's like, it's almost like he's kind of grown up, even though he wasn't like a child in Face Off. No, he's, but... he's in like his 50s, but he looks yeah, great. But, yeah, he looks great. And he was a wonderful, psychotic kind of character that you're well, just, like... you're not quite sure of. He's like Sean um, Norris from hell, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, man, there's just so many awesome parts in this movie, like hilarious parts, shocking parts, funny parts. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, Eisenberg has it right. You know, it's like I, watching it with an audience, I could see how people would be have kind of a nervous laughter with it. But wa I watched it just with me and my kid and I was laughing. But at the same time, I was like, oh, my God, that was fucked up. You know, there's multiple parts like that. And then they just do things that you don't really see coming. Um, and then and some of the stuff I felt like was like, OK, I know that this is going to be that. And I think, you know, what I'm talking about, you know, yeah. like kind of the, the reveal towards you. I was like, I kind of figured you figured yeah, that out. I early. had it guessed early on, too. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. But the way that it unfolds and kind of like when they go in the back room and all the other stuff, like there's definitely some stuff that comes to light and you're just kind of like uh <laughs> what the fuck and i loved it man i loved it i loved seeing all of that just crazy stuff um it's also you know it's a it's a timely movie even though i thought it took place in the 90s eisenberg said that it's supposed to be a time without time like it's not supposed to be clear whenabouts it takes place um but i i thought it was really kind of you know timely with the whole me too thing and everything but he actually said the movie was shot a while ago it was shot like two years ago so it actually would kind of predated all of this you know yeah. and, he said, and he said it's just kind of random that it does kind of pick up that 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 vibe because there's a lot of that in the movie done in a really interesting way right you know how they deal with misogyny and stuff like that and um you know and not and i never felt it was beat you over, the, you over no. the head yeah no, no, no. exactly I, I, no. I never felt like this was like oh this is no. a movie making a big political statement no. it was like it's very subtle but it does address you know certain things sure. but it's never like hey this is about toxic masculinity or this is about because in the end really that it kind of works out for jesse eisenberg in that sense you know not perfectly but it's like well for his character it does actually kind of work for him but there's still subtle differences too you know like with yeah. uh, jim poots like she gets well we, we should, we should I, I, I can't i can't go into it because i'll spoil it so because yeah. nobody will yeah. have seen this yet but you know the, the thing is um yeah it's i, hard I it's hard did say about. though while watching it, I wish I'd seen it in theaters because I saw it on a screener and you saw it on a screener too. Um, and it, it's playing at Fantasia in Montreal on Thursday night at 9.30. And I, this will have been in the past when this goes up, but that would have been a rocking audience to see it with because they would have probably gone crazy. And I heard from from people that saw it at South By, like I think Randy, saw it, Randy Jones saw it at South By and a few other people. And they were all telling me, oh yeah, it, went, it played super, super, super well at South By. Like people loved it. Um, and, uh, I don't know. I mean, I could see like the right audience seeing this movie, the right audience. I could see it becoming like a midnight movie, kind of one of those perennial cult hits. I yeah. think it's gonna be one of those movies too, in like five or 10 years, people in the dorm rooms are going to have posters up of this movie. You know, it may not necessarily be a big hit when it comes out now. In fact, it may be pretty obscure, but I really do think it's going to pick up a following over the years, especially once it hits streaming and stuff like that. And people get a chance to, to see it, but I hope they go see it in yeah. theaters. Yeah, I mean, honestly, like, I it's would implore going, people to go yeah. see it in the theaters. I, I may, depending on time, honestly, like, maybe I'll go see it again in theaters. Yeah, but this I'm is something I'll definitely, I'll definitely buy this. Like, this is, this is oh, a movie I'll too. own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, and this is a movie I'll revisit because there's just, you know, it, it's just, again, it's like Heathers or Fight Club. It's like, it's a movie that's worth going back and taking another look at, even if you're just going to laugh or just to see the fucked up shit. But you know, it's a. It really is a nice little indie gem that came out of yeah, you know, what kind of out of nowhere. What a surprising under the radar sleeper, though. Like really, like when I got the link to it, I was like, yeah, it'll probably be okay. You know, but it was. I was really impressed. But probably one of my favorite movies of the year, to be honest. Yeah, uh, dude. I mean, I was just talking to Jimmy O about this a little bit ago. What did he think um, of it? 
Well, I, I didn't ask him. We didn't talk about the movie, but I was talking about like how this summer like sucks for movies. Yeah, it does yeah. um, and like the best stuff I've seen. Like I mean, honestly, like in theaters, Endgame is still for me the best movie I saw in theaters, which is kind of pathetic because that came out in April. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then like Stranger Things three and The Art of Self Defense are probably the two other best things I've seen so far this year. And both of those I watched from my living room. Yeah, and that just kind of Almost. sucks. And I've been to the movies. Yeah. I've seen. I saw Spider Man. I saw God. I really love Godzilla, but you know, I guess that's you know, it's more of a personal kind of. Yeah, I, I, I know that's not a popular choice, but I still I loved it. But I I um, really had a good show. I really I, I I really liked Godzilla as well. Godzilla Kingdom Monsters. I mean, I think that was also a totally underrated movie. I feel like people had an agenda against it. They had a reason not to like. Like they didn't want to like it. I mean, which I think is maybe, just really weird because it's like uh, just yeah. Weird. I know. I really, I really had a good time with Godzilla: the King of the Monsters. I mean, it I, was I like Max to me, it was like the movie. yeah. To me, it's like the best, um, the best like kaiju movie with a bunch of monsters all in one movie. Uh, I still like the made, first made in the Pacific, states. Like, I still like the first Pacific Rim more, but it was my favorite Godzilla movie that I've ever seen, and that includes you know the Japanese movies, and I'm and I've yeah, seen Godzilla for me, Final same War for me. and stuff like that. But those are cheesy. They're fun, but they're cheesy. I mean, Godzilla King of the Monsters, I could see myself going back and watching again. You know, I really liked it. Um, but uh, it's funny that one more movie that comes out this week that I actually surprisingly enjoyed quite a bit was um, was Stuber. This is with um, Kumail Nanjiani and uh, and Dave Bautista. And it's directed by a real... And it was one of those movies, like, I went in, I didn't think it was going to be great, but it was interesting when I saw who directed it. It's Michael Douse, who's the guy who did Goon and Fubar and, uh, and a couple other cool movies. And this guy's got kind of like a really edgy, interesting take on things. And he likes movies from the 80s and 90s. So Stuber plays out kind of as like a lost 80s or 90s buddy cop action movie, right? Like the action in it is so basically what happens is Dave Bautista is a cop whose partner gets killed in the first scene. And his partner is actually a pretty big star. It's a cameo. And um, she gets killed in the first scene in the movie and uh, by Tony, by Iko Weiss, right? He wants revenge. Mm, yeah, yeah. But Iko Weiss disappears. So one of the reasons his partner gets killed is because his vision is really shitty, right? He has really bad eyesight, so he goes to get LASIK. But then just after he gets LASIK, he finds out that Ico Oasis is back in town and has, like, some big drug deal going down that night. So he has to call an Uber to drive him around because he can't fucking see a thing, <laughs> right? And then, so, it, and it turns out it's Kunal Nanjiani. And Kunal Nanjiani can't, can't basically tell him to fuck himself because he's gotten so many bad ratings from Uber. He needs the five-star rating. <laughs> <in order to laughs> But then things just get insane and it gets like it starts off as a comedy, but it gets really, really, really violent. And, the, and like a huge body count, like I'd say like at least 30 to 40 bad guys get killed in the movie. I mean, there's like that ultra violent shootout in a, in, a, in a vet's office and there's tons of blood and and uh, and the, and the action when it happens is legit. It's not slapstick like it's real action, like real fights with Dave Bautista, real gunfights, people getting killed, people getting shot, you know, good guys getting killed. And, and, it, and it's and it's almost like, you know, a lost buddy cop movie from the 80s and 90s. And, you know, Kunal Nanjiani, he is doing kind of a little bit of shtick, but it works pretty well in the movie. And like Eisenberg, what I liked about it is he plays it as meek and mild mannered, but he also doesn't play it as a total pussy. Right? right, like there's like there's something to him. Like he's not he's not a coward that's running around screaming the whole movie. You know, he yeah, is, and that would get yeah. old and tired. Yeah, kind of like he's Tucker in uh, Fifth yeah. Fifth Element. Yeah, he's scared, but you know, at the same time, he's not a total fucking pussy either. You know, and he's and he can be brave when he needs to be. You know, and it was and it was and I and I kind of liked that. You know, and that was that was what made it feel more like a legitimate movie to me than just some kind of one note comedy. And uh, and I really enjoyed it. You know, it was another movie that I had a good time watching. It's really R-rated, which was funny because I went to see it with my girlfriend and one of my buddies, and we were laughing our asses off at how there was a five-year-old sitting behind us because <laughs> the humor, because it's nonstop f-bombs and 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 it's super gory. Um, and a cool Montreal note: the director is from Montreal or lives in Montreal, so the whole movie Kuma, Kumail Nanjiani wears a, a Saint Viator bagel shirt, which I thought was great. <laughs> Well, how about that? They're great fucking bagels, man. So go see it. You know, just, those, are two, those are two movies, you know, that won't necessarily be big hits, but they deserve an audience. Like, I mean, Art of Self-Defense is on another level. Like, that, to me, that's one of the best movies of the year. I wouldn't call Stuber, like, a best movie of the year type thing, but it is 
something that I really enjoyed watching. I thought it was very, very entertaining. I gave it an eight on ten. And, uh, it's getting mixed reviews, which I don't really understand. But um, yeah, but the comedies are always kind of yeah. that way. You know? mean, it's funny, but it's more I'm honestly more of an action movie to me. But uh, no, I mean people. It's Dave Bautista. If you want to see Dave Bautista, what he'd be like in like a Lethal Weapon type thing, this is yeah. as close as you're gonna get, and he's really good in it. Well. I'm like, I'm not, it's not that I'm on the fence per se. Like, I think it looks interesting. I just I don't know if I'll make it to the theater. I, th well, I probably will. I probably we'll, would. We'll see. We'll see how long it stays open. Like, I don't know if it's necessarily going to be a huge hit, but I mean, I think yeah. you'd enjoy it. Well, yeah. and plus, you know, I'm going to be in the next two weeks. I'll be VidCon and Comic-Con and I, it, who knows? It could be gone think, by the time I finally get home. Your kid would probably enjoy it. You know, I mean, there's a lot of f bars. Of course he stuff, does. But, uh, but I would have watched it when I was a kid, so. <laughs> you know, it's a movie I would have for sure loved when I was like 10 years old. So yeah, maybe well, go see them. He'd probably like it. When I was 10, if anything that had swearing and violence in it, I was game. <laughs> I remember <laughs> like, being okay. the only kid. I was the only kid in my in my neighborhood that was allowed watching the adventures of Ford Fairlane. <laughs> <laughs> my Which kid has seen that. <laughs> oh well. Um, <laughs> Now is the time we're going to reveal our special guest uh, is none other than Greg Don Ray. Johnson. <laughs> that would be cool to get Don what? Johnson on. But uh, Johnson. You we're going to have Gray Drake. So, <laughs> uh, uh, I'm going to give her a buzz now and we're going to bring her on. So it's Gray Drake, everyone. Miss Movie Phone. Miss Movie Phone. Ms. Movie Phone. Miss, she's not. Yes. Miss Movie Phone. I'm Ms. calling her now. I'm going to bring her in. I'm very excited. Hi, you guys. Well, hello. Great. How are you? Oh, man, I'm awesome, especially because the Skype ring is like such a jam. <laughs> it is, isn't it? I always, every time I call Chris every week and I hear it playing, I almost like want him to delay answering just so I can hear it like an extra couple seconds. <laughs> it is really good. I was doing a little dance. I was like, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> So well, those great, guys I think, really know what they're doing. I think you and I <laughs> met at one point, Gray, on 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 a on a junket. Were you at Were you at the Dark Phoenix junket a couple months I, ago? Yes, indeed, I was, and I was wearing yeah. a silver hooded dress and was acting like yes! an asshole. No, no, I remember the dress, and it was really cool. But yeah, I was I was there. I was I I, I was the one who was who was passing around his iPad to everybody because I had the I had the um what do you call it the the Game of one. Thrones. No, well, yeah, and I because I had a wireless signal dr jammer, and I was kind of, and I was passing it around to people to watch it on the, on our Canadian streaming service that they have. Oh, that's nah. awesome. Yeah. Yes, I I do I do recall um that dress, uh no it was it was it was just so fancy and it had a hood and it was fun to pretend I was an asshole and it was making all the employees <laughs> of the hotel laugh a lot. Did you wear <laughs> it for the interviews? Um, I did, and I oh, nice. would. It, I'm really, I'm actually really proud of those interviews because uh, the, they're the fir world's first uh, psychically conducted interviews. I watched those oh. interviews. <laughs> they are legit hilarious. <laughs> did you? Was, so, did you? They, you got approval from them prior to starting. I'm guessing is that what you did, or did you just like somehow go into the zone and pretend like you were like talking to them, and they were just looking at you like you were crazy? Like, how did you work that? Well, I. Give me all your so, secrets. Uh, um, I I had done several panels with them before over the course of the last like year or so, and so they all we were all kind of familiar with each other, and they sort of knew uh, that I'm an idiot. <laughs> 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 and so I showed up and I did the interviews just like normal. And towards the end of the interview, when I had like 30 seconds left, I t I explained the idea and I said, so if we could just meaningfully stare at each other. <laughs> um, and, and that's when I was really like hamming it up and I was trying to make nice. like really crazy faces. Uh, and, and so I didn't, they did ask me beforehand, like Fox, they, they said, what are you going to do? And I explained it to them and they were literally, you could just hear them on the other end, just go, ah, whatever. Were they game about. though? Was everybody kind of game and into it? Totally. They were, okay. they, everybody was like. Oh my God, that's amazing. I don't think they had, I don't think they fully understood what I was pitching, but they were just like, whatever. Just a break. <laughs> but it it, it really things, worked so. though. It yeah. worked Thank well. You. Well, and that's the thing funny. is that I, I can work with whatever. Um, I just, I basic, the only thing I can't work with is open animosity. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I hear that. 
So what a, what, Grey, a strange, what a strange junket, though. I mean, it was one of those movies, like, I felt going into it, like, everybody kind of knew the movie was due to failure, though. It was a little bit, like, I found, like, it was, not that the rooms were low-key. Are you saying it was like a funeral? Well, no, it's, <laughs> everybody was kind of like, this movie's not going to do very well. And it was, everybody was kind of chatting about that in the in the green room a little bit, I found. And it was, I, I felt kind of bad for, for the studio. It wasn't like, nobody was thinking this was going to be a triumphant moment. They were almost kind of semi, like, eh, you know, it's fine. It, yeah, and yeah. I, I got the impression that they were also just tired, like everybody's yes. just busy, and so it it was sort of like, well, we'll just have fun. It's the last one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it's yeah. the The box office for Dark Phoenix was I when I was at uh, Spider Man uh, at the getting my my popcorn and soda. They gave out Dark Phoenix the special buckets and oh. cups for medium sized stuff because oh. they just had to get rid of them. Because nobody was buying them. So they were like, here, you get the specialty cups. And I was like, oh, cool. And I was like, oh, I, I didn't. Do we have to pay for these? He's like, no, that's that's just what we're giving out. Cause we oh, man. Pay. That's sad. <laughs> it was <laughs> sad. I was like, damn, that sucks. That's not fun. Uh, so, Gray, for those that may not know you, which I can't believe they wouldn't. But <laughs> tell us, how did you get into this job? How did this oh, happen? God. Yeah, you were brought in tomatoes first, right? I was, and I, 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 I wake up every day, and I said, "How, how did I get here?" Like it's a Talking head song. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> so I, the, the, the twisty, turny path that I took to get here is sort of one of those like internet urban legends, uh, because I have always been in the filmmaking industry, in the reality TV industry, producing stuff like that. But my hobby was always movies and talking about movies and watching movies. And my first job in Los Angeles was working at the Arclight Hollywood on Sunset Boulevard. Oh, cool. Ah. Yeah, and it was so amazing because back then it's like everybody was like a filmmaker or like an actor or they had some interesting talent and we were all super poor and we had nothing to do except watch free movies and steal food from the concession stand. <laughs> <laughs> and... um. So a, a friend of mine and I wanted to recreate those conversations because we would have so many amazing mm. nights just sitting around drink, drinking cheap beer and arguing about Tarantino or whatever. And a very kind of classic film student story, I think, where you know, everybody's so passionate and they're excited about what they're going to do and what they want to do in the world. And they have endless energy and can manage yeah. to survive on three hours of sleep a night. <laughs> <laughs> And so uh, we started a podcast and eventually uh, listeners of that, sh that podcast that was called the popcorn mafia uh, started to recognize us at Comic-Con. Mm. And we were like, what? Because we just <laughs> recorded, like we just recorded that podcast in my studio apartment and we had people who are kind enough to pay for their own movie ticket to watch it. We couldn't even afford to like ask them to, you know, to, we couldn't even afford to buy them a ticket. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and um, we had so much fun doing it. And eventually that's how I got hired to write movie reviews at movies.com. And so that was wow. my first like- When about was this? It would have been like 2012-ish. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And um, it it was uh, I I worked a long way pretty fast then. I mean that's pretty quick. It, it was yeah it was I I mean it it's been quite a journey. Because <laughs> 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 uh, I you know the thing about about film criticism that I always that always has made me really uncomfortable is that I'm a film uh, maker, mm -hmm. and I when I was younger I always felt like film critics really were just the people that didn't make it through pr the production track. Yeah, if you can't right. do teach, right? Kind of almost. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and I did I did used to believe that, but I'll tell you something else. I also used to believe that actors are a holes. Um <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, they're not really. I mean most in most cases. It's well, very you, rare that I've run into yeah. some to anybody that I was like, Oh, they were a total jerk. Like I mean super ninety percent of the of the time they're super nice you know what I mean? i'm going i'm going 95 percent. yeah yeah usually i would say that's about right well certainly in our line of work they're also like very pleasant because we're yeah. we're promoting their movies but the the reason i don't believe either of those things anymore is because i really started to pay attention to film critics that really meant something to me when i was growing yeah. up that people like leonard malton and roger ebert 
Yeah. Um, and and Paul Pauline Kale. Paul, daughter the is Kings. Really good. My, my mom's my, uh, daughter is really good too. Jesse, Jesse Mullen. Yeah, Jesse. She. I mean, so the thing is, is that people that discuss film films on a on a kind of a scholarly level are yeah. they're creating their own kind of art in a yeah. way. Yeah. Um, and I, I I appreciate the knowledge and the effort and the care that goes into the best examples of film criticism. And additionally, um, reading uh, Sidney Lumet's book about making yes. movies. That's a great book. Oh my God. It's, it's one of the most incredible books I've ever read. It really made me feel different about actors. I send, mm. I send Paul books sometimes and he never reads them. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> they just have to join the stack next to my bed. I have like a thousand books going at once. It's funny though, Gray, don't you find, and I mean, Paul, and we've all, we've all been film critics at times. I guess Paul, you don't review necessarily regularly that much, but you have written yeah, several, yeah, it's, so it's I, more sporadic for me. But, yeah. but I've been reviewing since, I guess, 2007 and stuff like that. And, you know, and going to the film festivals and doing the interviews and, and everything. And I find it's, you know, what I've always tried to do is try to figure out who's a good critic and who's a bad critic by reading a lot of criticism. And I find it's pretty easy for me at this point to figure out who's a good critic and who's a bad critic. And I think what being a bad critic is, is when you start to get really personal about actors or you start to really infer motivations for why they're doing what they're doing and 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 kind of you know attaching all this baggage to them that's maybe not necessarily there in the film like i was reading you know a lot of reviews i've been reading recently have frustrated me for for specifically dark phoenix you know they were talking about oh the actors all phoned it in and they're all really anxious to get out of their contracts and i feel like you can't necessarily watch the movie and think that because i mean how do we know what was going on on the set and i find it's just a lazy way for people to criticize a film there are plenty of other reasons that you can criticize that movie but i find that like oh they're just waiting to cash their paycheck is a really lazy one I agree with that, and I I do think though sometimes that it can feel accurate, like if a whole sure. movie if a whole movie feels fatigued, uh, but I do agree that ultimately that's just a lazy comment. And I think one yeah. of the best things about social media and the discussions that we're having right now as as a culture um, are that we kind of expose some of those lazy criticisms and we for what they are. And and yeah. I, I think that and I here's here's the God's honest truth about how I feel about my critiquing of films. I am not Pauline Kale or one of those scholars. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, same, same as same as I'm not Roger Ebert. You know, I mean, it's just yeah. not going to happen. Yeah, no way. And so the way that I always framed my critique of a film, uh, especially if I didn't like it, was more in an entertainment fashion uh, with like yeah. humor. Uh, and hopefully not, you could still like, they still come up on, you know, Google results when you, when you look at some of my stuff. And I hope that the stuff that I said wasn't that kind of lazy, mean spirited stuff. It was more like me being an entertainer. And yeah. it's that same, uh, Cause God, I just feel terrible when a movie sucks. Don't you guys? Oh, of course, it's, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, especially when you get as soon as you get, you got to do interviews after a movie sucks, you're just like, uh, oh, but how am I gonna do this? That's the weird thing, too, on Twitter, though. I mean, you must get this a lot, and I certainly get it a lot, uh, specifically writing for Joe Blow, because the people always infer that somehow the site is connected to certain studios, that <laughs> if you're paid <laughs> off, you're chill, We're and paid. God, it's not the case. But they also kind of assume that you don't want to like something sometimes. You go in, oh, you didn't want to like this movie. And I can't, I can tell you, I never go into anything not wanting to like it, because... I mean, who it's wants to like, waste two hours, two hours yeah, of your day <laughs> hating something? It makes no sense. Oh, I mean, I mean, that's I just the most nonsense see, thing ever. I remember going to see Welcome to Marwen at Christmas time, and I was just Oof. praying as I was walking in. I was like, please let this be at least watchable because I don't want to have to spend two hours in this movie that are as bad, that's as bad as everybody's saying it is. And God help me, it was one of the worst movies I've ever seen in my life. And it was just, <laughs> and it was, and it was. Absolutely horrible sitting through it. I, mean, I was sitting with my, yeah. I was sitting with my girlfriend and she said, you better fucking come back when I went to the bathroom. <laughs> 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 better be back. Better be That's so back. funny. Because if you're leaving, I'm leaving too. Fuck, you're the critic. <laughs> nobody, nobody yeah. in their right mind wants to sit through as many movies as we do and tell them, tell them all they're terrible. Like nobody wants that. We, I, I, I definitely think that I, I know for myself that I can, my mood and, and where I'm at in my life or things that are going on, they definitely can carry into how yeah. I feel about a film. They're human though. Absolutely. But 
Yeah. But that's part of the journey, you know, it's, and that's what I, that's one of the things that I love about film. And I've said this before is that it grows with you. It's like the only really one of the few art for art, art forms that grows with you because how you live your life, your perspective, your experiences, everything, it all changes as you watch these films. So like how you watch, say the karate kid in 1984 versus how you watch it now, yeah. you'll have that nostalgic factor, but you also have a whole life that you've lived up to this point. And when you watch that movie now, you're bringing all of your own life perspective into it. And it's, you can't help but do that. It's a well, beautiful totally. thing. What I always tell people is when, when people ask me about, you know, can you like something and then change your mind about it? I always say yes, because when I was a kid, I remember seeing Blade Runner when I was 10 years old and I hated it. You know, I wanted Star Wars <laughs> and it wasn't Star Wars, right? This is boring. Yeah, I thought it was really boring. And it was and then I saw it again about three years later when I was 16. And I was like, oh, yeah, OK, it's OK. I thought it was okay. And then I watched it again when I was 18. And I was like, this movie's actually really, really good. And then I watched it again when I was 21. And I thought it was one of the best movies I've ever seen. And by the time I was 24, it was probably my favorite movie. You know, so, and, that, and totally. I've seen it countless times since then. And that's just how you change. It depends on hey, what you watch it. Yeah. It, you're, you're absolutely right. And I have to say, I mean, it's like, I used to think that the original Amityville was like so scary. And yeah, like, oh, I was so scared yeah. of the dad. And then now I watch it and I'm like, listen, I get what he's going through. I've moved my family too. Is this the Margot Kidder one? Yeah, is James that's Brolin. Brolin. James Brolin and Margot Kidder? Okay. Oh, yeah. I, listen, I think James I saw it like Tiger. So, so long ago. Man. It, 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 oh, the what? Amityville, actually, that's one of the more fascinating horror movies um, because it really did affect me when I was a kid. And then um, in watching it again as an adult, that's like really seen some things. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, you know, like I've sat through like all of Lars von Trier's movies. You know what I mean? Uh, like a, yeah. the, not even not even <laughs> including something like the Saw franchise for God's sake. Uh -huh. The Amityville Horror actually really becomes interesting because you start to see all the tricks and you and it's impressive how people responded to it. And I just love imagining this innocent kind of sweet world that was really scared by that movie just because chocolate sauce was coming out of the walls, like as opposed to our <laughs> horrible hellscape that we live in now. <laughs> it's also one of those things though, sometimes when you're a kid and you see a movie and you love it, when you go back, you're so disappointed because it doesn't hold up. I mean, a, a sad story, when I was a kid, when I was about four years old, movie that I loved watching on, uh, on the Canadian HBO first choice was Solar Babies. Right, I was like, oh, this oh, movie's yeah. great. They're on yeah, roller skates. Babies. They're on roller skates. They're, 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 they're post-apocalypse. There's this glowing ball. It's terrific. And then a, a couple weeks ago, I, I got um, Prime Channels just came to Canada. And there was an MGM channel. I was like, oh, yeah, because they had all these great movies. And I was like, Solar Babies, fuck yeah. And I put it on. And whoa. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I remember seeing the trailer for Solar Babies yeah. in the theater. And I just remember everybody like, what is this? Like, but they were still fascinated because it's, it's a not like it's apocalyptic roller skating movie. Like, what, what is this movie? Solar well, baby. And it's also it's... produced by Mel Brooks. I know. Oh, you know what? If you want it, so if you like that, okay, you've got to watch um how did this get made? Sometimes does behind the scenes versions. And they had um one of their guys, the researcher, got to interview Mel Brooks because oh. he called, he called up Mel Brooks's agent and he was like hey mel brooks want to talk to us about solar babies and then they were like well we could ask him probably not going to happen then mel brooks ended up calling the guy like a half hour later and he was like oh yeah i'll talk to you about solar babies and he ended up, and he, ended up, ended up, ended up, he ended up having this amazing interview with him where it's like your demented grandfather that you and he's and he's fantastic and he talks all about the genesis of solar babies and why he made it he's like i thought it was going to be star wars and then he, he said that what happened was he said that that with, sol he, with solar babies as the title yeah, it's going to be star wars it all himself he he and and but the director didn't know what he was doing and he kept sinking more and more and more money into it and by the time shooting was over he was 16 million dollars in the hole <gasps> of his Lord. own money on the line and the movie made no money at the in in theaters but luckily he except was for books. chris bombray's money no but he luckily he was oh, no, you just watched it on the hbo he said something interesting. If you watch, if you listen to the interview, he said that the craziest thing about Solar Babies in the end was that it ended up making money in about thirty years because when it hit <laughs> DVD and it became kind of this cult thing, 
people started buying it again, and he said that it's unbelievably it's actually broken even since 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 nineteen eighty six. But it took him about thirty years to finally get. It was the same thing with like Waterworld. It was the same way. Yeah. Everybody assumes the Waterworld yeah. was this huge yeah. flop, but it actually turned a profit. Not only did it make yeah. its money back, but it actually turned a profit, which is crazy. Mm-hmm. So yeah, uh, I think so- reputation can can proceed on those. <laughs> Fun fact, Mel Brooks is one of the nicest men I've in, heard. in the world. Yeah, I've and heard. my dad and I got to interview Mel Brooks. Oh, amazing. <laughs> oh, that's cool. And my dad is the one that showed me Young Frankenstein. Mm. And oh, wow. it's like it's like our favorite movie. And yeah. he, he showed me a lot of Mel Brooks stuff. And so one day he was traveling to L.A. Uh, with his girlfriend. And I was like, hey, you guys, just come to the Fox lot. Nice. And they were like, oh, wow, that's cool. Like, we're going to go to a movie studio? And I was like, yeah. And the <laughs> deal was, yeah, I just didn't tell them anything about it. My family is entirely too trusting. So <laughs> they were doing um, a mural on the side of the studio that they shot Young Frankenstein in. And Mel Brooks was going to be there. And they were dedicating it. And he was doing some interviews. So we got to see that. And then at the end of the dedication, my 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 family just thought that they were getting to see Mel Brooks and dedicate this mural. But then we got to interview him and Man. It, it was so incredible. And my he, in, Mel Brooks was actually asking my dad a lot of questions that were mostly like, how old was your child? Have you ever had protective services called? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my dad showed me, Blazing Saddles when I was probably about 10. And I mean, I, I, I watched all those movies <laughs> growing up too, though. I mean, I, I loved them. I thought they were Amazing. great. You know, my you, dad loved you, Mel Brooks too. Do you know what's funny? When they re-released Blazing Saddles in honor of the late, great Gene Wilder, uh, uh, I we wish went I to the- I, That's a regret that I have in my career. Oh, I, God. I love, I legitimately love Gene Wilder. I think he's oh, wonderful. Such a treasure. And, yeah. and um, we went to go see it in the theater and- <laughs> It turns out that the enormous and frequent use of the N-word and yeah. everything else doesn't really bother anyone. But the one thing that set my audience off, like that was just unforgivable, was punching a horse. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always thought that was the funniest scene when I was growing up. <laughs> when Mongo punches the horse. Uh, and my dad used to laugh until like he, oh, his beer would come out of his nose. He just thought it was uh, so funny. It is hilarious. It's so yeah. great. I was like, oh, okay, so that's the one thing that's that's wrong with this movie. God, it would never get made now. I don't know that anybody could make it the way Mel Gibson, Mel, Mel, not Mel Gibson, geez, Mel Brooks did. You know? I mean, no, it's just, no, no, no. There's, yeah. there's no way. Comedy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah comedy's, comedy is a, I don't know, it's like a dying breed these days. I, I Like with Stuber coming out this week, I was like, man. And you saying like, oh, it's like a hard R and all this other stuff. But I'm just like. Studios have got to have like cold feet, like any time a comedy is proposed anymore, because it's like everything is dangerous. Is... Though the comedy, I mean, movies hard are, but it's mostly for the violence and the swear words. The comedy is not particularly edgy, which I feel like is just going to dumb down yeah. comedy over the long yeah. haul. You know, because that's like all they're going to be able to do. It's like, well, we'll swear a lot and we'll kill lots of people, but we're not going to do any kind of jokes that are like, you know, even slightly controversial. And that's what comedy is. You know, it's like when you're turning a mirror on everything in society you know and and having a laugh but will but people be able to pull it that. off as well as mel brooks did though because he had the intellect too and he had the compassion and the empathy for people that's the thing about well, mel he's, brooks. he's not dead yet who, who knows maybe he's still got one more i hope so I, for me. <laughs> I feel like the that our real world itself has become such a satire it that it is impossible for any kind of art to yeah. really keep up mm-hmm. I agree. And so it's going to be, I think it's going to be a while until we can really start getting some good comedies back. Cause it, it's, it's, we're, we're in a tricky time right now. And I think, you know, I think the the pendulum has to swing to the exact opposite end and we have to start balancing things out, but only until we get to a more equal footing, as far as every group of people goes, it's, it's comedy is going to be next to impossible. I went to yeah. see, I went to see Dr. Strangelove when we were in London at the BFI. Because I was, I was, I had, I, when you guys were all doing the Rocket Man junket, I wasn't invited. And uh, I had huh. the day off. And I was just kind of, I was, I happened to be in the BFI and they were playing Dr. Strangelove. And I was like, oh, I'll go in and watch a little bit of it. Cause they were, cause I had just been at the Kubrick Museum exhibit and I was excited. And, and, and it's funny when you watch that movie now, 
it does not play as a comedy. Nobody was laughing in the theater. People were watching it like it was a drama and it was disturbing. And it's funny because I can't imagine <laughs> an audience laughing with Dr. Strange Club now. But back in the 60s, I think it was seen as a real ribald comedy. But now it's not considered a comedy anymore. And that's so strange. That's it's one amazing. Of the most, that's yeah. one of the most chilling things I've ever heard someone say. Yeah, it's weird. <laughs> hey, isn't it strange? Yeah. Because God help us. You know, I mean, anyway. Uh, I just, but but I have to say, it's like uh, just the first thing that comes up always in my mind is, gentlemen, there's no fighting in the war room. There's no fighting in the war. Room. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, when when my dad first showed me that movie, I was too young, I think, to fully appreciate it. But I knew even that shit was funny. I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so before we get into news, Gray, I need to know. We need to know. <laughs> what is Miss Movie Phone? Tell Ooh. us about Miss Movie Phone. Uh, Ms. Movie Phone is uh, the she, she basically she's she's Mr. Movie Phone for a new generation because Mr. Movie Phone meant a lot to people in like the early to mid nineties as a resource for movie show times over the phone. Like and Kramer. To exactly. Kramer <laughs> loved him, hence America loved him. And <laughs> So we didn't have a lot of options for movie showtimes back then. And, and Russ Leatherman had this amazing, iconic voice that he used for Mr. Movie Phone. And that's how he ended up as this great Seinfeld bit. And See, this so, didn't exist in Canada. We didn't have that. That's right. It was an American you didn't have, only thing. No, we you didn't had, have movie we phone? Had, we had an automated line for movie theaters, movie theater listings, but it wasn't like, hey, this is Mr. Movie Phone. Like, it was, it was just something that was, this is the Point Claire Plaza, press one for this movie, press two for this movie. And it was just kind of, there was no real personality behind it. Yeah, See, I remember calling and listening. You'd have to listen to every movie and every showtime mm. until you finally got to what you were looking for, and then you just hang up. Yeah. That was what? my experience. With, with Movie Phone? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Well, because I know that you could, um, you know, it, like you press three buttons and the old keypad system and then it would, you know, guess based on the numbers what you, you know, you have selected Jurassic Park. And you're like, no, man. Oh, I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. Time. I want to see last action. <laughs> <laughs> and so, hey, um, summer 93. You know, it was an imperfect system, but a great one nonetheless. And so well, what happened, all we had. We didn't have the internet, so what are you going to do? Exactly. And then so that's how I would pick the movie that my friends and I were watching that weekend. Mm -hmm. And it meant, it really meant a lot to me. as a, It just was a cultural kind of touchstone in my life. And so the company itself changed hands over many years. Uh, Russ made out like a bandit. Uh, he Eventually all the phone lines were disconnected. And the movie site, however, still has a stunning amount of traffic to it. I uh, didn't it even is... know that Movie Phone was based on a phone service, but now hearing the title, I'm thinking I should have known. But I always thought I always thought of Movie yeah, Phone just dummy. As, a movie, as a movie site. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you know what's funny yeah. about it is that you, yeah. people that aren't exactly familiar with it, you yeah. always have to spell it for them because it's Movie F O N E. Sure, and I know. I, yeah, and I realized that they came up with that cutesy tootsy name before there were websites and people had to spell stuff. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> well, I mean, people misspell Joe Blow all the time. I mean, Oh, of course. Well, they should yeah. just add a W at the end. But the thing is, yeah. Bears bought a bunch of domains, so I think if you do that, it still goes to the page. Really? Yeah, I well, think so. Any smart I'm entrepreneur would that. do that because I, I, unless, I mean, only because I go to the site do I know that there's no W. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's all that's always fun. I'm like movie phone with an F the way the good Lord intended. And they love that joke. <laughs> <in the Midwest. laughs> um, so what what's happened now is that the the uh, folks that run it, they kind of want to make movie phone a bigger deal. They want to make it a modern player. They really want to put a lot of um, emphasis and interest on the website. And they realize that the way that they should do that is bring back Mr. Movie phone. And so uh, our general manager, Matt Atchity, and I worked together at Rotten Tomatoes, and we really wanted to work with each other again because the th first thing they needed was a team of people that were prepared to bring like really fun, interesting content into this very crowded field. And yeah. so the, the game plan is that as we resurrect the app, as we kind of beef up our features and offers on the website, 
that we also have this spokesperson in me that is recommending movies, that's talking to all of the talent and making sure that movie phone has like a little space in this very right. large world of movie content. So you're like, which is like, now you're the face of movie phone. Yes, I am. It's so crazy. It's such a weird thing. And it's so cool. And the, the other cool thing that they want to do is they want to figure out, you know, the way to bring the phone line back, which is uh -huh. really super. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I think there's a way even if I mean, there's got to be a way to do it that would be compelling for people to actually dial their phone. Like, again, I think it's the same principle in terms of like what you guys are doing now, like, you know, having a face, you know, you're like out of all the people I've ever seen at Junkets, you are always like the standout person. Like you everybody knows who Gray Drake is like oh, you, you, you. you have like an outfit. You're like, oh, my God, there's like what is Gray wearing this time? I remember the first time I don't know if we met, but I remember you at the Deadpool Junket. And you oh, had yeah. like a whole Deadpool get up. Like you show up for the show. You're yeah. not there like some jerk from Alaska that wears a Wolverine t-shirt to the Logan junket. Oh, um, hey, listen, which, which gets <laughs> respect, which gets respect. But the thing is, is that I, I continuing the, in the, in the publicity world, the way that I was in the critique, you know, crit criticism world, uh, I consider this to be entertainment. Um, yeah. I'm I'm not really very good at getting scoops and I'm not good at getting people to talk about their next project and I'm not good at getting an exclusive piece of, you know, uh, such and such about, about that belongs in the newsreel. Right. Instead, what I want to do is just go into a room with these people who chances are their work has affected my life really deeply in some way. Yeah. And and just sure. try in this super weird environment of a hotel room to have like a human moment with them. It's speed dating. It's what I always, it's the same thing. It's what I always say. That's what these junkets are. They're it's speed dating. Totally. You have like four minutes to make an impression. And that goes from introductions, unless you know you already know them and they happen to remember you or misremember you, as that happens frequently. <laughs> Yeah. And you know you have four minutes with these people who are being just inundated with others all throughout the day, and you know I can I can only imagine that when Gray walks into the room, they're like, oh thank God, it's like not just a <laughs> it's 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 <laughs> funny all trying to get some shit out of me about my next project. Like yeah. Gray just comes in and you know she's got a, a totally different energy, which I think is just great because, and I guarantee you they pro they look forward to that because. You know, they get a lot of the standard stuff. So, like, I get it. I totally get it. I think that you have yeah. to kind of stand out. And I get, you know, this the the age of, like, showing up in, like, a stuffy, you know, business casual outfit and asking very stern questions. Uh, this is a crowded marketplace, just as you yeah. know. You have to stand out at least a little bit in some way that's, A, going to make you memorable, B, yeah. That's going to get some kind of interaction that's interesting, whether you're getting scoops or just a genuine, fun conversation in that little speed dating capsule of time. It's tough. So I get yeah, really I, nervous when I'm talking to them sometimes because I, I don't do it as much as you guys do. Right. Like I go to the junkets maybe, you know, once a year or something like that. But then I do these interviews mostly a tip. Right. That's kind of my thing. And um <laughs> I always get so nervous. Pretty relaxed. I mean, I think people. I mean, I think people like that though because I'm a, it's a little bit more like what would happen if your friend was to meet these people. Like that's kind of more <laughs> what it's like when I go in because I'm not really, you know, how there are some people that are very like kind of uh, accustomed to doing that and they're not really shaken up or, or surprised when they meet somebody. Me, I tend to be. Oh my god, it's so and so. <laughs> Hello, how are you? <laughs> you know, I'm trying trying to keep it cool, trying to keep it together. Like I. <laughs> Yeah, I was it, I was really kind me, of it took years to get to get past yeah. that. It really did. It took years to get past. Mm -hmm. uh, and now I can say genuinely, like when I go into a room, I'm not like sweaty or nervous or like, oh, my God, like, but it took years to get past yeah. that. I don't know. Great. Is, is that the same for you? Or do you do you still get nervous? Or is it just you're just walking in and you're good? I do get worked up still. But it's a it's different, certainly, because I remember my first junket interview oh god it, it's it was at comic-con and uh they were doing like a fright night the remake junket oh, oh yeah, yeah 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 and I, so i did one junket and this so this was my very first one this was while i was still writing reviews and so i had no idea how anything worked 
I was, uh, because it was Comic-Con, I was dressed like Tinkerbell. <laughs> That's and, how it all began. I know, it, it kind of is, because I was in the hallway, and I realized that the only way to, like, assure that my wings weren't hurting people or poking their eyes was to lean against walls, flat. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was standing in the hotel hallway and I was standing against the wall and then here comes Colin Farrell and um, he sees me and he smiles and he he's such a magnetic, warm yeah. person. Yeah. He's, he's one of those people where guy. you're like, oh yeah, he's so lovely. And I'm like, oh, he's one of those dudes like, you know why he's famous? Uh, yeah. I interviewed like, him for, for um, uh, oh God, uh, that movie by the guy who did three billboards, Seven Psychopaths. And it was, it was oh, just, right. so, just a round table. And it was, but he walked into the room and, and I was like, man, he is such a good looking guy though. Like it's crazy. It, yeah, <laughs> you know? he's, but he's so warm and he's so yeah, down yeah. to earth too. Yeah, and yeah. it's really like, it's so impressive. And so anyway, he's walking towards me and he's glowing like movie stars do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and he goes and he smiles and he laughs. Says, oh, hello. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, forget it. And then he goes, he goes, oh, my God. I'm so happy I didn't wear my Tinkerbell costume to interview. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and I kind of, I, so in this, this actually happened and this was, this was sort of a, a kind of a harbinger of what was to come in my career. I sort of blacked out a little bit and I didn't yeah. realize what I was saying. And <laughs> I, I stepped away from the wall and I said, well, that's good because this is a Highlander situation and there can only be one. <laughs> <laughs> and he, and he stopped and he looked at me and he went, fucking hell. He goes, I did not expect to see Tinkerbell making a Highlander reference today. <laughs> <laughs> and that speaking, is a good, that's a good one to pull out. That's a, that's a good comeback. Speaking of Highlander, is. very randomly, I saw Christophe Lambert this weekend. He was at Montreal Comic. Where? He was at Montreal Comic Con. He was signing autographs and he was doing photo ops and he was just sitting in his booth. I walked by him. Couldn't say anything because I mean he was, you know, he was there, you know, working and I, I sure. didn't want to I didn't want to pay a hundred bucks to get my photo taken with him. He seemed lovely though. He was wearing his sunglasses like he always does, and uh, you know, because he can barely see. He's like mostly blind to him. He like really, really, mm -hmm. really bad, really bad myopia. So like the sunglasses mm -hmm. that he wears are, are prescription. I've always heard that about him. And um, yeah, it was just cool seeing him though, because I've always been a fan of a kind of a fan of his, but yeah. Well, he he was on. He's on this um, show that I I watch on Netflix called Call My Agent, and it's a French show. Oh, and nice! As himself, is, and he's uh, he's on the show as himself, and he's oh, so nice. great on it. And I it makes me love him that much more. So I'm like nerded out that you saw him actually, because that's really cool. Is that like a reality show? It's not. It is a. It is about a French talent agency. So I fly a lot and I download a lot of weird stuff off Netflix just to try. And Call My Agent is a French show with subtitles about a, a talent agency in France. And it's it's really, um, it, it's interesting how different it is from the mm -hmm. US because it's France, but it's also shocking how similar. Yeah. And what's cool <laughs> is that even though they do mention a lot of American superstars, it's mostly focused on French superstars. Isn't so, it Guillaume, uh, Can Canet? Guillaume Canet did it? I think so, yeah. Because his wife is, is uh, Marion Cotillard, and I think she's on the show, isn't she, as herself? I don't know if I've seen her yet, but yeah. uh, it's. I think it's a really smart, funny, interesting yeah. show, and I also just love anything insidery about Hollywood and, yeah. and, and the, the comparable markets. <laughs> <laughs> well, that certainly appeals to our breed of folk. So, um, so Gray, what is the next step for Miss Movie Phone besides getting the phone lines back up? You're just going to continue doing what you do just as Miss Movie Phone now? Yeah, you know, we we've had a actually a really good encouraging run of my my the first season of my show, the Ms. Movie Phone Show. Uh, mm -hmm. We stayed up all night thinking of that name, so thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's been going really well. And so our idea is to kind of separate um, the seasons by things that we want to do. So this this season, um, which it you can find it on our social channels on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. Uh, it's all about the summer blockbusters and we do one show per week. And the way that I get to make the show is I get to decide what movie I want to promote and then I can shoot whatever I want as sort of the wraparounds to the interviews. And so mm. 
Like we, you know, the one, Paul, you and I were out in Japan for uh, Detective Pikachu. Yes. And so the, the, the way that we presented that episode was sort of as a film noir. Mm-hmm. Um, cool. we just, we did a, the psychic interview we were talking about earlier for Dark Phoenix. <laughs> um, and I love it. we also, the, the last episode, uh, was actually the one that it's like one of my favorites because for Spider-Man Far From Home, I talked to everybody at the, about their like type two fun. Have you heard this phrase? No, no. Okay, so I'm about to learn something. Is it like type okay. two diabetes? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, it's type two onset fun. Oh. Um, no, no, it's it's um, so it's the kind of thing that happens when you're traveling and it's horrific while you're going through it, but later it becomes a very good story. Mm. And cool. it's like, in oh, it's okay. funny when yeah, you're not yeah. in the middle of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the time that we got it's funny when husband, you get away from. Yeah, yeah. My, like when my husband and I were in Rome and we got locked out of our Airbnb and then he and the guys from the weed store broke the door down. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, it's like super stressful for me while I was trying to enjoy my gelato, but really funny after the fact. <laughs> yeah, or like when I just lo- or when I lost my Airbnb keys last month in New York in Crown Heights. <gasps> oh, <laughs> no. Oh, yeah, so... but it was in the coffee shop that I was in and the guy was holding them for me and he was like, hey, I thought you'd be back. I have your keys. And I was I almost hugged him. <laughs> well, I, I think you should go back there and hug him because yeah. <laughs> so I, I think so, the tears said it all. <laughs> oh, I know it's so stressful. Well, so the yeah. thing is, is that we I talked to all the stars about the, those specific incidents because it's a, the movie includes like how Peter's trying to go on vacation, and yeah, the way that we packaged it was as a cheesy travel video. Oh, cool. Mm. And so. The I, I had a spider on my shoulder that was helping me do the interviews, and her name is Penelope. <laughs> Wait, not and a real spider. No, she was a really big, fake, weird spider. And All right. so well, the Penelope budget's and I, not that high. You guys aren't getting action <laughs> trained spiders. Okay. Right. Ex- no, not yet. Not yet. Maybe season <laughs> two or three, but we're not um, there yet. We're not there yet, but we packaged the whole thing as Penelope and Gray's Far From Home Travel Agency. Uh, and th- to have that kind of creative freedom to do all the really weird, random stuff I want to do has proven to be like some of the most satisfying stuff in my career I've ever been a part of. It's- well, it just gives you it gives you something original. It gives you, a you know, just as you said, it gives you a little creative outlet because this stuff can get dry if you're not doing something with it. So kudos yeah, to listen- you, man. It's like awesome. Thank you. Well, I think what what comes next, because we we will we'll have a award season upon us, I think we'll be doing something that's definitely different, you know, but that's kind of the freedom of the plan so far is to constantly evolve what the show is and be appropriate for the season of movies that we're facing. So it's I, I'm just I'm really excited about it. I think it's going to be awesome. So let me ask you, Ms. Movie Phone, if you had to make a recommendation, what movie is in theaters right now? Do you think not enough people are going to see? Well, hands down, it's Booksmart. Really? No, definitely, yeah. yeah but- Which is, and, um, like, already out of theaters, because I tried to go see yeah, it, and it was gone. Sad. I know. I, I, I only see it here in Los Angeles, um, and it's that, to me, is criminal, but I really hope that it finds a new audience on streaming, because I, I thought it was, like, one... Speaking of comedies, one of the more satisfying comedies of yeah. this year, hands down. I agree. Yeah. I hate that I missed it. it yeah angers me like I, the one, I, one the I week that i had the time too. i know but the one week that i was able to go and i was like i'm just gonna go see book smart and i went to go look up times and like where in the hell is book smart this was like three weeks after it opened by the way so it wasn't like wow. i was waiting like, you know two months into it i was like dude really <laughs> i also i also find that um yesterday is being underrated a bit i really like that movie just a good yeah. song Movie. I, I think uh, yesterday it's interesting that it, I don't think people paid that much attention to it. And I wonder if the same thing is going to happen to Blinded by the Light. Oh, yes. I, hope not. I hope not. I loved Blinded by the Light. Oh, And I've heard, yeah, I've heard nothing but good things about Blinded by the Light. But I think the problem is that they're so similar and kind of, you know, just in that mode. You know what I'm saying? Like all like the story itself, it's like, you know, aping old older musicians and like kind of bringing them into the forefront kind of thing. And I just think people are going to be confused. They just feel like they're too close together. I don't see how they I don't see how they fly, but I could be wrong. Like maybe 
blinded by the light breaks out, but I don't know, man, that's a tough, it's a tough one for standard audiences that are people that are just going up to the ticket booth, you know, it's crazy to us because it's hard to believe because we're so far removed from it, but people still walk up to the box office and stare at the titles to decide what the hell they're going to watch. Yeah, like, I mean, if they even get crazy. out to the movies at all. It's crazy. And these are the people that are honestly fueling the box office. We tend to, uh, I, I said this on Twitter a couple of weeks ago, because you know, I just noticed how like every now and again, people tend to get like, oh, they get all uppity about this stuff. And I'm like, listen, film Twitter is not the box office behemoth. Yeah, it really it's isn't. bringing in the money. It's your everyday people, like your average movie going populace that goes to the movies and brings their family and stuff. Those are the ones that are fueling the box office, not like, you know, the Twitter diehards like they're. Yeah. they're and it's finding movies. a way to connect. It's finding a way to connect with that audience. I think that's yeah. the big challenge for these upstart studios. Absolutely. Hey, Absolutely. speaking of which, how did how did Midsummer do this weekend? <laughs> it, made, it made 10 million. It was like in it was like in fifth place or something like that. But it made I mean, for a movie like Midsummer, I don't think 10 million is necessarily bad. I think it's pretty yeah, good. It wasn't good either, though. It's it's kind of middling. It could, is it because I, that ten million for that movie to me sounds gigantic? It's I mean it's yeah it's exactly because it's not. Necessary. But I think it cost ten million to make. Well, and it went out on twenty five hundred screens. That's the thing. So, so I think that's. I don't know. It still has a chance though. I think uh, it's got a lot of good word of mouth or just word of mouth, not necessarily good, yeah. but like, like weird it. word of mouth. I really. Uh, I, I almost I almost went this weekend, but I uh, ended up not going, even leaving my house because I have. To save every dime I have, because I'll be at VidCon and Comic Con for the next two weeks. Boy, Bay. All right, Gray, are you going to Comic Con this year? I will be at Comic Con. I am so pumped, actually, because this year I'm hosting the Terminator Dark Fate panel. Oh snap! Oh, dude, I I'll cannot be there. wait. I'm so excited that's about cool. that. So that so that's, is this your first? You, you wait, is this your first Hall H panel? I did the Predator panel last year in Hall That's H. Right. That's um, right. I was and, there. I still remember. And I got to, it felt really validating uh, to be able to share my excellent Predator noise with everyone in the hall. <laughs> um, if I do say so myself. I mean, you have to um, do it now. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I love that, that Gray didn't even have to think about it. She had it ready. She was just the, ready to a, go with it. It's truly a part of me. It truly is. And well, and so that actually. Do it. I can't do it. Oh. <laughs> I'm pushing too many pencils. Oh, well, that's pretty, that's a good. That's actually quite good. I Thank seriously you very much. For a second and just look behind me. Well, sure I Arnold Schwarzenegger was a huge, huge, huge part oh, of God. my I would, childhood. Yeah, so. I would, even me too. I mean, if if I honestly, if I could probably meet one person now, I think probably Arnold Schwarzenegger and Stallone. Those two, they would be the guys. I, I think. Yeah. Um, totally. Well, I've well, met Stallone multiple times, but I would love to meet Schwarzenegger. That would be sweet. And the the last time that I interviewed Stallone, it was for um, Creed, and it was so I had just gotten back. I was in Philadelphia, but I'd just gotten back from Berlin. I'd barely gotten out of Berlin on time because of an airline strike. And so I flew back. I had to throw my bags in the room, go see the movie, wake up early the next morning, and get to the interviews. And I realized just before I went into Stallone's room that I had left my engagement ring on the ring of on the rim of the sink <laughs> in in the hotel room that I had just checked out of. Oh no. And so I I yelled at them. I was like, I have to run out and get my ring and I'll be right back. So I literally ran from the interview hotel back to our our press hotel. I I managed to get the ring. I put it back on. I ran back to the interviews and I was all sweaty and I they threw me in the room there. Everybody was so mad at me. <laughs> and 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 as as is typical to my interview style, um, I ha I feel like I have to be honest about what's going on with me up front because it's generally <laughs> pretty self deprecating and and it kind of breaks the ice. And so I was like, um, oh, I was like, I am sweating buckets. And Sylvester Stallone is like, really? Are you are you nervous or what's your problem? And and it goes medication. And I was like, no no no. <laughs> I said, medication. And I said, listen, I just got engaged. And I left my ring on the sink, and he goes, "Oh, you're gonna get in trouble." 
and, and I said, but I'll tell you what I literally just did is I ran out of the hotel and I'm singing to myself. Dun, 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 yeah, dun, of course. Dun, dun. Of course. Oh, I I'm kind I go, of, da, da, da. I'm right? kind and of I was like, yeah. if it helped me get back here. And I was like, because by the time that I, re I came back, I was finally like, going to fly like that you know <laughs> i'm kind of hoping that maybe i'll get to meet him finally because rambo last blood there's been some talk about it possibly doing the fall festivals and if it went to tiff i'd, I'd love to interview stallone just because i mean it's such a big part of my childhood him and schwarzenegger just the icon of icons i'll always yeah. love those guys i feel like i'd lose my shit though <laughs> on those guys i'm sure it'd be an entertaining interview because i'm like oh hi well, that's the well, thing. If you're going to lose it, lose it for him. He's a, well, he's a good I, guy, and he's a really fa fantastic interview. He's a I, shocking human. He's smart. Yeah. You know, I lost it when I met Cruz, though. That was another one. I totally lost it. But oh, it was... my God. I, I still look at the photos of me with Tom Cruise, and yeah. I wonder who that girl is. Yeah. yeah <laughs> who is it? Funny story. Chris got to meet Tom Cruise because I got sick. Yeah. So thank yeah. you. You're welcome. <laughs> for being thank sick. God. Son of a bitch. Thank I hate God. you. I hate your face, Chris. <laughs> so, the, um, uh, oh, and the other thing I'm doing at Comic Con, by the way, we have our very first movie phone panel on Saturday night, the 20th at 8 p.m. And we will be welcoming a panel of judges. We have Scott Mance and Andre Black Nerd, and uh, and oh, yeah. um, and we and so we'll what we're doing and Marquia McCarty, by the way. So they're going to be judging our audience members who will be presenting their least favorite movie ending and their suggestion for an oh, wow. alternate. Ah, interesting. And we will be judging the best idea of the night. And then we have a whole team of actors who will be improving the scene out at the end nice. of the night. Oh, and wow. the title of the panel is happy endings. <laughs> <laughs> that is classic. <laughs> God, I'm trying know, to guys. think what my least. I'm trying to think what my least favorite happy. What my least favorite ending is. Oh God, I'm I'm really blanking on it now. Oh, that's actually a great question. Yeah, to be right? honest with you. Thank you. Because I, I mean, I could I could like toil on that for a while. Because there's a I lot mean, of movies where I'm like. I could tell you movies that I wish the ending was different just because I loved the characters, but just because I want the ending to be different doesn't mean that it should be different, right? Like it sure, works automatically. And I'm not saying that it's good. Like. You know, one of the movies I love is Carlito's Way. And every time I watch it, I'm like, oh, I hope he makes it. You know, I hope he makes it. And, <laughs> and John Leguizamo shows up as Benny Blanco from the Bronx and puts two bullets in him. I'm like, ah, yeah, asshole. Blanc. Yeah, you well, know, and then, there's but then a lot it's, of movies like that. There's tons of movies where you watch, like, it is the you, best you already ending. know yeah. that it's a downer ending, but it's like there's this weird thing inside you when you watch it. And it's like, it's almost like there's still hope within you yeah, that in some is. strange yeah. way, the movie is suddenly going to end on a lighter note or yeah, a note that's this time he's going to make it. <laughs> yeah, but it's like this is well, never right. going to happen. Completely unrealistic. But there's still that glimmer of hope every time I watch one of those types of movies where I'm like, oh, and then it happens and you're just like, oh. When like, I'm doing my viewing of McCabe and Mrs. Miller, I don't want oh. dude to freeze in the snow. <laughs> but every dang time he does. He just keeps doing it. Never watching it's it again. It's funny. A movie that's kind of like that for me is. <laughs> have you guys, have you guys both seen To Live and Die in L.A.? I love. Oh man, and that was like an on the oh. set decision oh. they made too. Okay, they were it, like, because in To Live and Die in L.A., it, it ends with with William Peterson getting a shotgun blast to the face and dying. And which is there like is super yeah. extreme. But there is another version where he survives, and it's on the DVD, and it is so strange to see it. Because you're like, this is what would have happened if he lived. And oh my God, it's awful. Boy, they made the right decision. But it's like so crazy because William Freakin made that. They made that decision like on the day. They were like, what if? The I, still don't understand. I still don't understand how he was supposed to survive a shotgun blast to the face in the alternate ending. But yeah, you see he's, <laughs> him and him and John Panko, they're in Alaska and they've been and they've been reassigned. As, Why yeah, is everybody like, go to Alaska to escape? Yeah, yeah. Someone as, come as, here to no, live. As, you know? as punishment. As punishment. <laughs> <laughs> they're like you're that's like in that first mission impossible uh when he's like the dude that that screws up in the security room and he's like i want a manning a guard tower in alaska by the end of the day i'm like come on man it's right that don't that's not this was beautiful up there it's yeah. gorgeous it's um, really I'll hot you, right now 
that's nice. I'll tell you an ending that uh, infuriated me. Uh, I don't necessarily want it to be different. I just it made it made me understand that Spielberg like leaves something to be desired with his endings. Yeah. And that is in War of the Worlds when uh, oh God, the, yeah. Yeah, the yeah, sun yeah. shows up alive. Uh, yeah, oh, that was yeah. terrible. People were groaning in the theater when I saw that, though. You weren't the only yeah, one. Yeah, it made me really angry because, I, I mean, he shows up and his whole family like looks like they haven't even been through anything also. And they're sort like, of like, well, we were just having hot chocolate and it seemed a little <laughs> noisy out there. <laughs> Munich was like that too. Munich is like ninety percent of a really good movie, but then he's having he's making love to his wife, and then he's having flashbacks to when the guys got killed at the Olympics, and he wasn't even there. And he's having sex with his wife, and then there's like drool coming out of his mouth, and he's like, ah! and it's his poor wife. I mean, that's, that's just a weird. That's just a weird place to go when you're having sex. I mean, sometimes you know, I get it. You know, it, it could be a little challenging, but it's like really. About the murder of these athletes, like it's just it makes <laughs> like, it so strange. I just can't oh my God, stop thinking guys. about that. It's yeah. crazy. Well, my first, my first response when you brought that up is that that's basically every person's worst fear when someone is making love to them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You're but, not thinking about people being murdered right now, are you? Well, but also, um, well, what if that's just, what if that's just <laughs> Eric Bana's way of lasting longer? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I mean, it could be. <laughs> I know he's like, don't, 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 don't go there. <laughs> I don't know if I trust him now after seeing Dirty John. You know, I mean, I'm always kind of now. It's like, maybe he's not the nice guy I thought he was. Oh, uh, so we, we do need we do need to get into some news. Yeah. Um, but before we go into that, I just have to remind Gray that I am still available to record your theme song, which I will have you know, I sing my theme song that I made for you in Japan. I will. This is no bullshit. I sing it at random sometimes and catch myself doing it. I'll be like driving somewhere and I'll walk or I'll walk out my house and I go, Gray Drake, Miss Movie Phone. I do it all the time. So if you don't ever use that, it's going to be so disappointing. But just know that there's some random, well, I'm not random, but you know, one of your peers is running around just singing some theme song that he created for you in Japan. And I love that. it works. I'm going to give it to you one more time just for fun here. But here it goes. Gray Drake, Miss Movie Phone. It's perfect. Cut print. There it is. Yeah, that was it. That was now that I've done that twice today, I guarantee you it will happen again. <laughs> At random. It's going to happen. Uh, so. It tickled me so much when you first came up with that. And I, I it definitely, it, it also is sung in our office. So you definitely have made a mark. And oh. I never, listen, for season one, we had to really put it out very fast, but never say never because you truly have have made a mark on the film community with it. So, <laughs> but I do think that would be a great part of your intro. You get somebody else, get uh, you like Warrant or Guns N' Roses or somebody to sing it. <gasps> you got you're Warrant. gonna have something great. When I Cinderella. <laughs> yes, incredible. Yes. Oh, uh, okay. So. Now that everybody knows who Gray Drake is, if you didn't already, now we're going to talk about some news. Mm. And Gray is going to chime in with us because she's joining us. Mm. And I have a lot of crappy opinions I'm happy to share. All right. So let's talk some wonderful news. So today we saw uh, that Todd Phillips revealed for the Joker movie this is actually not based on any comics or have any kind of connection to the comics in terms of adaptation adapting any particular issue or origin and that they basically just wrote the story that they wanted to tell of the joker so is that sacrilege or is that an inspired choice what do you guys think i mean i think it's a good choice really it seems like they're doing something on their own you know that's a little bit different from the other batman movies and i'm all for it i'm still really excited to see it i'm hoping that it goes to tiff as well we'll see but uh i'm pretty excited yeah. i think i think it's actually pretty wise Mm -hmm. Because at this point, it seems to me like the DC universe is just folding over and over and over on itself. Yeah. And I can't keep up with what timeline we're following or where what happens when. And so I really like the fact that this is sort of a new, theoretically, it's a new crazy take on a property we're familiar with that sort of stands as like this satellite thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just like, I don't want to be more confused. I yeah. just, I don't. 
But don't you think this will probably confuse regular audiences even more because of that? Because there's I feel not like people are just going to go see it just because it's a joker, just a name recognition alone. And the oh, movie. I think so, too. I think people are going to go no matter what. Um, but I still think that there's going to be just this whole like, hey, we're, it's not part of the universe or, hey, this one is part of the universe or this one isn't. I think it's it's just kind of like they're just kind of making it even more like tricky for people to follow along. And with Matt Reeves, Batman taking place in an earlier timeline, I think that's going to make people <laughs> even more like, I what? still feel like those oh, two are going to be on. connected though. Like there's some, they kind might of be, yeah. I still think from the Joker trailer where he goes to the gated, you know, house and he's like, puts his hands to, on the, the little boy and makes him smile. I guarantee you that's Bruce Wayne. Uh -huh. That's my theory. You guys yeah, I'm telling you, I think, I think that's a good, it's it's definitely a great guess. And I think that you're right, that people will be confused no matter what. But at least, to me on paper, I feel like this helps me compartmentalize it a little bit. The only thing that's going to be really thorny, not only is Matt Reeves' Batman going to mess things up probably also, but sequels. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Yeah, like, like what if Joker is like absolutely huge? And then you have Batman is huge. And, the, you know, apparently this Batman's not going to have Joker in it. Or is I it really think that in, at but... some point, Joaquin Phoenix is going to turn up as Joker in those movies if it's a hit. I, don't, it's just, hey, it's a hey, that I, have. I could be wrong. It's interesting. It's... I think it's the conundrum of this connected universe shit, which works great for Marvel because they started it from that way. Um, but DC, you know, as much as I love the DC films, and I really do, uh, it just I feel like they're just they're getting too convoluted and it's it's almost like the comics too in that sense because the dc comics have always been more convoluted than marvel so it's just i don't know maybe it's perfect maybe it's perfect in it's imperfection I, don't mm, know. I think that it i think that the warner brothers leadership has really shown its 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 colors and how different they are as an organization from marvel yes. uh, just because there's not there's no synergy between the television and the movies uh, by design at that company. And so unfortunately now it's just a tangled mess. <laughs> yeah, it really is. It really is. But it's like a tangled mess of like, but really great stuff in there. But it's just like a mess in terms of like coherency when you're trying to build like the shared universe thing. It's just, it's all over the place. Yeah, and I feel man, like it's, it's just a... getting more and more crazy. So how much so. more would we have liked Justice League? Uh, I didn't think Justice League was a very good movie, but I might have liked it better if they had waited and they had released the glory that is Aquaman before. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. Yeah. yeah and then I cool. actually had Aquaman in costume, like his actual costume. I mean, that's and... the way they should have done it. And they just didn't. Uh... Yeah. I mean, or have <laughs> the flash or have the flash come out as well, which now Andy machete is uh, about to tackle, which I think is a great choice. Um, yeah. But yeah, like really it's just, a, they, they, they bum rushed uh, justice league. And I think a lot of it too, was them buying into Zack Snyder's vision and then getting cold feet when BVS didn't get the critical reception they had hoped for. Cause it still, it made the money. It just didn't get the critical reception. And I don't know, man, that's, just, that's where that, that's where that, that crack started right there. So yeah. who knows? either way, I, I'm gears, excited though. for the joke, but we'll see. Switching gears though. I'm, I'm, it's interesting. Cause I'm looking at the lineup that you put down. So, um, Hallie, Hallie Bailey has been cast as Ariel in the little mermaid. Hallie movie. Berry. Holly oh, Berry, Bailey. <laughs> Holly Bailey, Holly Bailey, <laughs> Holly Berry actually wrote a thing that read a really nice thing about it. I know, but so I saw, I saw that, and I was like, as soon as I saw it, I was like, I saw Holly Berry cast as Ariel, and my first thought as soon as, okay. I, as I saw that was, <laughs> wow, good for her. Like yeah. that's exactly what I thought because I was like, oh, that's Holly Berry. I was like, wow, that is a hell of a role for Holly Berry to secure. And then I went back and I was like, oh, Holly Bailey, and but I, I bet you Holly. I'll bet you she is named after Holly Berry because she's very young. I wouldn't be surprised. I, it's funny, though, you wrote so you wrote controver controversial and it's it's weird. I've seen that a lot. People have been posting a lot about Twitter, but is it controversial? Like, I feel like the only that's people... why that's why I put in parentheses non controversy because I feel like everybody's pretty cool with it, except for a couple of lunatics. I mean, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, that's yeah. And yeah. you'd have to be because like I looked because I went back and I was like, OK, well, yeah, she's, she looks she's like a Ariel. black actress. And I went and she looked and I was like, Ariel. like yeah, she looks exactly like Ariel. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, wow, she's, I was like, hey, good job. Like, she looks yeah. great. Yeah. Um, I feel like I feel like nowadays, though, too, it's like we start to look for the controversy yeah. when there really isn't any. And it's like, like we're kicking open upset. Like, why would they yeah, be? they're like, really not upset? And it's like 
I feel like, you know, there's always going to be a couple jerks out there that are going to say oh, sure. something, but I feel like we're really kicking over rocks to make this a controversy yeah. when it really isn't. There really isn't a controversy. I think people are like very accepting of this and like, hey, cool. She looks great. Well, I, I, certainly, I hope they're accepting of it because it's yeah. a friggin' cartoon and it, we, oh, I don't even, I think the 24 hour news cycle has hurt all of us for this reason, because in the online world, you got to find something to write about. Yeah. And so you, you're starting to look to social and you've got, you yeah. know, yeah. some person that's tweeting something that gets a lot of response, but when but you it's look just, at usually it, it's the crank though, usually it's just the crank. Yeah, yeah. And it's just one person. So I, I actually am really excited about the choice because just before the casting news came out, we were discussing that Melissa McCarthy could be Ursula, which I think yeah, is now confirmed. Yeah. yeah. And we were talking about who would Ariel be. And I was specifically saying that I hope that it was young talent that I wasn't familiar with yet uh, that would sort of help educate me as to like what kids are watching. Yeah. 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 Like a, like a Victoria justice or like, any any kind of kid that is big on like let's say Disney or Nickelodeon and so then here comes Halle Bailey and she's this incredibly talented singer I had no idea that she and her sister existed and I'm so excited that I know now because it seems yeah. like oh cool there's like going to be something new and interesting similar to Mina Masood in Aladdin like great I yeah. you know Mina Masood in Aladdin though I, I have to say like I don't know if he was great in it. I, I really liked Naomi Scott a lot in Aladdin. Uh, yeah, and I thought that was, awesome. that, that was a great discovery too. Like she was, you know, she'd just done Power Rangers, I guess, but that was, I, I thought that was a real kind of star of tomorrow type thing. Mina Masood though, I don't know if, the, if he was really like seasoned enough for that part. You know, I, I don't know. I had some issues with this performance. I didn't think he was bad, but I thought it was like, maybe they should have hired somebody with a little more, to them you know who was a little more seasoned a little bit more experienced i don't disagree with what i think you're saying the final result is that he wasn't mm -hmm. very like sparkly or attention getting and no i think it's i think it's probably just because the movie itself had some problems um yeah so what why don't we make a deal to revisit the conversation <laughs> after his next film <laughs> <laughs> well but you know great great you make a great point though and that is that you know, getting some new emerging talent into these things, because how much of a groaner is it So uh, very frequently where, you know, you have like this big property and they're like, oh, hey, so and so is going to play this character. And you're just like, oh, that's the best you could do. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, it really is nice uh, to bring in new talent and new voices. And, you know, that's how you that's how we keep making the donuts. You know, like you got to you got to bring in fresh ingredients. You got to bring in new talent, new people to kind of add, you know, to to continue paving this road for the, you know, the future of entertainment. And I think it's great when we find uh new talent. So Disney has well, been good with for, that though. But I was all for Halle Berry when I fucked it up. So, you know, <laughs> I mean, the girl, I the girl that did Barry was Ariel. So what the fuck am I talking about? The girl that did <laughs> Mulan though. I mean, that's a good, that's a good choice as well. Yeah. So. Oh yeah. And so like the Mulan trailer dropped this Sunday. Uh, I, I, I checked it out and I was like, dude, this looks like it could be, to me, anyways, it looks like it kind of break the the familiar mold of these adaptations, which are really kind of taking on uh, a very Disneyfied MCU kind of level in terms of like they're very they have a formula at this point. Um, and, I, and I thought the Mulan one, I was like, this could be something different in a good way. Yeah. And that that actually got me excited for Mulan. And I think this is one I'll actually definitely see in theaters. I didn't see yeah. Aladdin. Um, I'll see Lion King just because I'm. It's the Lion King. Come on, but uh, <laughs> but Mulan looks really intriguing to me. I just I first off I love you know like Asian culture is something I just love. Like oh, and Donnie like, Yen, Donnie yeah. Yen's in it, man. That's the greatest. Yeah, Donnie Yen. Um, Jet but it Lee. just looks really cool. Although I I'm very curious what they're gonna do to top the Jerry Goldsmith score. Cause the score in the, the animated film and Jerry Goldsmith is, you know, he's, he's yeah, passed on one of the best. That's you know. such a great score, man. I hope they find somebody that can at least ape Goldsmith somewhat. Cause that's a tough one, man. But I think it just looks really good. I um, just wish I, I agree. Actually, I was very impressed by the trailer. I just wish that they would remake their bad movies. Yeah, I, 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 
I agree with you. It's, it, it is always kind of one of those things. Like, I mean, Aladdin, when they remade Aladdin, Aladdin was great, you know, so you're, all you're going to get is kind of a pale imitation, right? It's never going to be as good as the animated version. Sure. I mean, even, that's great. That's a great thing. All or even just beyond Disney movies. Like when you think about remakes, why are, why do they never remake movies that just didn't quite work? You know, like let's take another crack at this and actually do it right. Yeah, I mean, and that I, would I think it's pretty unfortunately, I feel like the answer to that is because the pencil pushers say, yeah, oh, well, we we know that this movie only made X amount of dollars. So even if we re- remade it well, it wouldn't do more than this. And so they just sure. mostly decide not to. Whereas, I, I mean, I think the Mulan, I think you guys are right that this looks like, oh, there's finally a reason to have a live action movie because this looks gorgeous and it looks interesting and um i love that actress i want to know more about her all all the plus all these other actors i already like but my boss had a great idea the other day um to remake the black hole oh yeah that would be crazy right like as a live action yeah that'd be nuts you could really but do a great but that was that's my question too though is like what happens when they get to the end of this well yeah i don't know about that they're gonna start making you start making live yeah. action Pixar movies? Like, what's next? Yeah. What's oh. the next one? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I mean, oh. like, come on, guys. Really? Because, I mean, at some point, they are going to reach the end of that rainbow and they're going to have to figure out what they're going to do. Especially, and I guarantee you, what we're going to start seeing is sequels. That's what's going to happen. Just like we have if they, episode. Or especially if they keep making them at the rate they're making them now. I mean, there's no reason that, you know, Dumbo, Aladdin, and The Lion King should all be coming out within, like, four months of each other. It's ridiculous. And then it's Maleficent, really too. Close. It's too uh, much. But uh, I guess sequels and prequels are, are ultimately what's going to end up happening with these. And I'm sure that's what they're thinking about. Because once you get to the end, you're going to have to do something. You know, they're not just going to let that cash cow die. So... I'll be, it'd be interesting to see what they do, you know. I would. I mean, I think everybody, most people, would prefer something new and original. But how do you do a new and original uh, adaptation of, of a movie that doesn't exist? You just have to create something. So it's a totally different yeah, ball so of wax. Good, good luck. That's like good that's luck, the se- luck, Disney. That's that's the second scariest thing that's been said today, next to people watching Strange Love as a drama. <laughs> <laughs> but you know. Um, to- Originality, though, for time about originality, how about another Expendables movie? <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty original. Oh, uh, dear. You know, you gotta love Stallone. Like, just you know, he's 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 up there in age, you know. But he's like, I don't give a shit. He's like, I'm just gonna keep making what I make. <laughs> as long as like, he's able to. I, I totally bro. respect yeah. it, though. I respect the fact that he knows who he is. He <laughs> knows what works for him. He's not like. I'm going to stretch out now and I'm going to make, uh, you know, some really intense, dramatic movies. And it's like, dude, you, you tried that. It didn't work, man. Like stick to what you're good at. And I feel like he's at a point now where he's confident in what he, yeah. what he can do. And I respect that, even though like, man, it really, honestly, it sucks so bad that Expendables three was not good because that was my, no that idea. was my first set visit. Yeah. My oh. first time I met Stallone, and I was like, had all oh, it was such an amazing experience. Like I went to Bulgaria, and then like it was just such an amazing experience. And then I went to the premiere of Expendables three in London. Like it was just a great experience all around. But the they've movie yet, wasn't good. I was just like, damn it, man. They've yet to make a really great Expendables movie though, and I'd love it if they did that. If they made a really, really good Expendables movie. I think the first one had the right pulse of where to go in terms of just being like a hard R kind of, you know violent throwback kind of movie but then they just took a step backward with the sequel and then part three was even more of a step backwards so yeah. i don't know but if he could find that like kind of the pulse of like the rambo type stuff that he's done like with you know rambo 4 and what looks like last blood will be that'd be great i mean i'd be down for it but i i think we're probably looking at some straight to video stuff based on him I mean, I, well i just saw plan. escape plan three the other day and yeah i mean uh, but hey maybe that's maybe that's what's gonna work for him you know so so be it stallone you keep doing your thing bro yeah. <laughs> what do you think some of us will go see someone we want i'll be there for rambo last blood without question yeah no that's the, the thing it's it's not that these movies can't be really good it's that it's really challenging yeah and you have to get you really have to get the right people behind them because yeah. having Kugler behind creed was brilliant yeah and um, the expendable, uh, the first expendables was close. 
Um, but you really need to have the right kind of knowledgeable, enthusiastic, I think, nerdy fan to guide yeah. you in the correct direction. And and I, so the Expendables movies to me, like, I don't remember anything from them except how excited I was that JCVD was in the second one. <laughs> <laughs> except for the first one, which was Stallone, they always kind of get hacky directors or kind of uh, journeyman directors. You know who I'd love to see tackle uh, Expendables for? John Woo. No, but you know who? <gasps> well, he'd be fine. But you know who would be even better be though? Fine. Like, he'd yeah, be fine. He hasn't if done if a I good movie in a while. Here, I'd smack you John, in the John Woo mouth. hasn't done a good movie in a while though. I mean, you his last calm, one. Better Adam, calm down. But you know who I'd love? Unless he got Chai and Fat to be in there, that'd be great. But you know who I'd love to see uh, tackle Expendables is we were talking about art of uh, self defense. Riley Stearns, man, I'm telling you, that guy could make a fun Expendables movie. I mean, talk about a guy who's, who's caught up on that kind of film. I mean, why not? You know, that no, could no, be no. that's a stretch. We'll stretch. see. That's that's a pretty bold venture. I don't know, man. Why not, though? Take a big risk like that. A big swing. Well, I mean, they kind of did. Well, I mean, they kind of did it with Patrick Hughes with part three. And they were like, hey, you know, he did this great little, you know, indie action flick. And I don't know, we saw that worked out. Not so good. You need a guy, though, that's that's like a strong. You need somebody with a strong personality, though, that also they're not going to kind of bulldoze because, you know, Millennium yeah. is. A studio like that, I think they do a lot of things on the cheap. I oh, think for sure. Neil Marshall probably got bulldozed on Hellboy, and the movie turned out to be garbage. Uh, they need somebody like a Ryan Coogler, who, you know, Ryan Coogler is like, I'm going to do it my way, fuck off, type thing, you know? A strong yeah, well, person. He still has to play ball. He, I'm sure he, he didn't say that to uh, Kevin Feige on the Marvel set. I'm sure Feige cool. was like, that's cute, but uh, yeah, we're going to need this done. <laughs> but I'm sure that at the point, though, he probably you know, was able to get enough of his persona into it, though. I mean, it does feel like that. You know, I think you need that kind of person that was not going to necessarily get bulldozed. I don't think they necessarily bulldoze people at Marvel. I think in Millennium they do, though, because they shoot everything on the cheap. I don't know that they bulldoze, but you definitely got to play ball. And that's like where Edgar Wright, you know, because Edgar Wright is very much a, no, this is 100% my show. That's just how he works. And that that's why it didn't work out with Ant-Man. He was just like, I can't work this way. I can't filmmake by by committee. It's just not going to work for me. And you know, I think that's ultimately what it comes down to. Some filmmakers they can they can play the game, and some of them just don't want to. You know, and they just got to do their own thing. So, well, and this is this conversation just makes me think about the reason that I'm uncomfortable with criticism in the first place because mm-hmm. it is a miracle that a movie gets made and onto yeah. that screen. Absolutely, and there are there are so many things that can go wrong, and there it it it's like you can't ever place the blame in one place. And the fact that Creed turned out so well, uh, mm. it it might have just been a coincidence <clears throat> because that that nobody stood in front of Ryan Coogler. What turned out to be a great vision, and yeah. but it's like you get one producer in there that like decides that he doesn't like something, and then you the whole movie could be ruined because then yeah. everything yeah. from there on out gets messed up. So it's it is a miracle that we see a film on screen. And yeah. I, I like your boldness, Chris. I like this. I like where you're going because I, I think that if Stallone had, if I don't, I don't know that it'll happen. But I mean, if Stallone really had guts, he'd be able to take a chance. I, I don't know that this franchise is small enough to do that, though. No, probably not. Um, you know, Paul, the next two things, actually, it's funny that Netflix smoking thing kind of ties into Stranger Things. Maybe could we tackle Lord of the Rings series first? Yeah, let's do it. Let's get so it into Jay, it. So J.A. Bayona is directing the first two episodes of the Lord of the Rings series. I don't think that's really big news, though. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be J.A. Bayona's Lord of the Rings. It's just that he's going to be the guy who calls action on the first two episodes. I don't think it's actually really that big news. I thought that he was originally going to direct all the episodes, and that would have been exciting, but he's only really directing the first two, so it's not a huge deal. Yeah. But, you know, I, here's the thing, and I said this before about J.A. Bayona is – uh, this this is a man that has made me cry. He's a great director. Uh, in two other movies, uh, I really I was like, if he can make me cry, Jurassic or Jurassic World: Fallen Kingdom, that would be <laughs> a trick. Didn't happen because um, yeah. I didn't love uh, Fallen Kingdom, but um, his, I like the, the I other liked, films are just. I, I, I did like. It. I did like. It <laughs> I cried in a different oh. way, Gray. I, try, I cried well, in a different way. I did oh, like it more than Jurassic World. Like- though. You didn't like the dinosaur auction? I'm shocked. <laughs> yeah, I just thought that was crazy just, that they were uh, selling them so reasonably, like a million dollars for a dinosaur. It's like so. I, I, 
God, that's it. By like, like ten dinosaurs. Like, I'll just a, get. I'll, I'll see money. if I can maybe borrow on my uh, on my yeah. retirement. Maybe I'll just yeah. get a dinosaur. Fuck it. Yeah, yeah exactly. I'll put my own Jurassic Park and just have a Stegosaurus yeah. in the back. Just one dinosaur, but people would come, right? You know, it's a little. Yeah, yeah it was just you know it was so it's so. The one that Jurassic spits, Park. Like, by the one that spits, you know, that does the thing like. <laughs> yeah. Come you in and you can get guy. blinded and killed by a yeah. dinosaur. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but anyways, like J- like The Impossible, I think it's just it's such an amazing yeah, movie. That, that it is great. Movie. By and, you know, as a parent, when I watch that, like it just oh, it fuck pulls at the heartstring. And also, if you're a Tom Holland fan, uh, get a little peek at his uh, acting skills prior to being Spider-Man. It's yeah, really great. Really good in it, too. And, um, Watts and Ewan McGregor. <laughs> Yeah, it's just it's such a powerful wonderful film and i i just i love it i it's a great watch um but yeah fallen kingdom was was a letdown for me uh, based and, and i think maybe i set up my expectations a little too high uh, but i do think jay Bayona is an exceptionally talented filmmaker and i would you know we're talking about people having some creative control here i would love to see you know what he does uh with this project but my fear is that it would be a fallen kingdom type scenario where it's like, Hey, you know, we love having you here because you know, you get really good shots, but we need this, 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 this yeah. done. I mean, I think it's that's how like, it's going to be it though. It robs him of the ability to really kind of tell I, a, a, a personal story in that sense. So I don't think, I don't think that TV show running is necessarily a director's medium. It's much more important who the executive producer is going to be. Or the show and they right. kind of settle on a vision, but the, but Bayona does have an opportunity here to set a visual pace, and I think that's probably yeah. why they grabbed him. They're like, well, you know, he has experience in making, you know, Paul Shirey cry, and also he can mm-hmm. handle dinosaurs. So there's that. Um, and I think, <laughs> and yes, yes, exactly. Um, but I think that uh, the more interesting aspect of this is that it's taking place in the Second Age. Is that right? Is it called the Second Age? I don't know. That is actually a prequel to the movies. I mean, so you can't do it any not, other way, though. Yeah. I think it's brilliant because why even try to recreate yeah, there's that? No, there's like, no point. How are you yeah. going to do that better? Really? Like, well, you can. You can. It's fruitless. So... But like you could make the show leading up to that final battle with Sauron and actually be something amazing. Yeah, you there's could. so much story that could be told that we haven't seen. Uh, if you really want to go back to the Lord of the Rings era, I, I would I would be happy to take that trip. But I would I was always kind of dreading that I would have to rewatch basically these films just made on Amazon. But now I don't have to. Yeah, because since not, I. I think that I think he's such a great director. I love what you said about setting a visual pace. You know, I hope that they take advantage of his talents. Yeah, there's definitely tons to explore. Yeah, I mean, well, because he has those talents, you know, like, and he's great at these personal moments, and he didn't get those in Fallen Kingdom, not like he should have, you know. Uh, I just feel like he can really he can tap into those heartstrings, and it's not that like you got to cry at every movie that he makes, but I feel like he just has a knowledge of kind of people. Yeah, uh, I would an, like to see empathy. that. Yeah, and he's also he's a really deep knowledge of hobbits. He knows how they <laughs> act and how they are. So <laughs> he, he a shame not to exploit that. Do you think so, there's gonna be any hobbits smoking? <laughs> well, they do smoke. If the, it was the, gonna be on Netflix, the, hobbits, the mead, it would you know? be yeah. subdued. Yeah, that's funny. That was a good transition, Chris. No, because um, they do smoke in the Lord of the Rings movies, though they have. They little do. Pipes. They smoke the, the shit out of some shit. They're like smoking all the the, the weed. Yeah. I would too if I had to deal with those orcs. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Netflix is pledging to cut back on depictions of smoking. Um, I guess I, I'm not sure exactly where it all stems from, but I know that I Hopper. Think it, I think and... it just got into a lot of shit in the Stranger Things because I mean, if you watch season three too, he is smoking constantly, and so is Joyce. Right, but here's the thing, and this is where I'm not I'm not opposed to. I mean, I have a child, and I tell him not to smoke and all that stuff. But the thing is, like, people do smoke. Um, it was the '80s, and yeah, and it, it is a different era that we're covering. And the other thing is too, I just I worry sometimes about you know we're like, well, we need to promote uh, change by you know not ever showing that something happens, even though it actually does. So. You know, I have to wonder, like, how much are we actually hindering uh, artistry by doing this? Are we, 
you know, where you're kind of saying, well, you can't use this storytelling device. Your character cannot smoke. Like, well, my character smokes. That's part of who they are. They have an addiction. That's like what they do. It's like, you know, it's like John Constantine can't smoke. Yeah. Well, that's like a, a pinnacle of who his character is. Like you kind of, you may think, well, it's just, it's unhealthy. It's like, well, we're not telling people to do it. He we're does. Just... He, he, they did make him smoke though in the Constantine movie though. Yeah. Yeah. But, I, that, but that's my point is like, if you know, it is, does this lead to, you know, Hey, we're going to, we're not going to let people smoke anymore in movies. Just I, can't I, do I, it. Kind of of two minds of it because I like stranger things. It really doesn't bother me at all. Cause it was the eighties and he was a cop in the eighties. And my, my parents both smoked in the eighties. I was, I'm a child of the eighties and they both smoked constantly. They don't smoke anymore. And they had health problems years later because of it, it was a bad thing for them, but they did smoke. So I don't necessarily have a big problem with it being shown in that context. It's not like you're having the kids smoke, but I don't like it when smoking is glamorized in movies. And they used to do this all the time. And I remember in Men in Black, Tommy Lee Jones was always smoking. And I didn't think that was cool. One time that I had a really big problem with it is I was working for um, Paramount Pictures years ago. I was kind of what I did when I was in university. I was their Montreal marketing rep. So I'd go around and I'd show basically the new movies to, to audiences and get audience feedback. And I did this movie next with Nicolas Cage. And oh, yes. it was a PG-13 movie that was being marketed towards kids. And at one point in the movie, he's just walking around smoking a cigarette like a cool guy and making it look cool. And, and, and that really bothered me because it was in a it was in a movie that was ostensibly aimed at, you know, at a, at a younger audience. And um, they were doing it in a way that they were like, oh, look how cool he is because he's smoking a cigarette. If this had been in an adult movie, it wouldn't have bothered me. But the fact that it was in a movie that was aimed at a, at, at a younger audience really did bother me. And I, and I had an issue with it. And I don't think that that's cool. Doesn't bother me that much in Stranger Things because it is historically accurate. But in that case, it did bother me. Yeah, this is so tricky because I, I definitely think that to some extent... Uh, our, what we see does have a deep effect on us. And Absolutely. We, and and I, I think that that's evidenced by how excited, you know, so this is a Stranger Things 3 spoiler, so people are, you know, tune out. If you, Spoilers! <laughs> I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't seen the last two episodes yet. Don't ruin it okay, for me. What? Okay, okay, okay. Hold on, hold on. Then what I'm going to do is it, I'm going to, I'll, I'll reframe what I was going to say so I don't spoil it. And instead say that there's something in the last episode of Stranger Things that a lot of people are really connecting to and are really excited about. Mm -hmm. And it is partially because movies do affect us. Sure. Yes. And so I think what we see does make a difference to some extent, but the things that it's like the, the unsexy things that go along with the conversation is yeah. that when you're taking in media, especially when you're like a young child, it's important that you have people in your life that you can talk with yeah. about things. So you can Very kind true. of process it and you can talk about violence. You can talk about smoking. You can talk about a whole bunch of stuff and kind of get a perspective on it. And it might not, it, you might not think smoking so cool after you talk to your parents about it when you've seen a movie together. Um, like, but that's not a sexy conversation. Like <laughs> it's, you know, nobody wants, nobody wants to talk about that in the media, but like, you know, you need people, you need older people to help you process things that you see. Yeah. And, you know, then there's also just the link to, uh, you know, kind of mental illness and what happens when your brain is taking information in, in a different way. Well, I, and, I read I read a report where somebody was saying basically they wished that A Star is Born had come with so-called trigger warnings because they were really upset by the suicide at the end of the movie because the person themselves was suicidal. And they said that it totally sent them into a, like a suicidal despair spiral. And I think that's too much to put on a movie. It's I think it's too much to put on anything because yeah. in the end, you know, if we were going to start putting chains on everything that, you know, is meant as entertainment, but then you, you really, it's not entertainment anymore. Yeah, and it's, it's not it's, artistry it's for sure. It's going to be safe and bland. Yeah, everything. And be safe one and of the, the most beautiful things to me about, about entertainment, because it's not just entertainment, like movies, books, comics, uh, music. This is the human experience. That's what, to me, like this is what speaks to me about art and about us as humans. I think it's the one thing that makes us human. Like, you know, animals don't make art. You know, insects don't make art. The trees don't necessarily make art unless you're kind of viewing it in a specific way. But it's like <laughs> human beings that is the one thing, one of the one things that we do that no other species does. 
-hmm. And it's how we express our own existence. And if we're going to start saying, well, you can't show that. Like, well, but that happens. Like, well, you can't show it because people get offended or they get triggered. And it's like, well, how is that my problem? This is the real world. If they can't accept what goes on in the real world, I don't understand why I have to take responsibility for, you know, oh, my God, I showed somebody smoking or somebody killing themselves. It's like, you know, you there's already MPAA rating and, you know, you take a risk anytime you open up anything mm -hmm. uh, to be triggered or offended. But you don't have a right to not have those things. So no. it's tricky. Yeah. It's a, it, it is tricky and it's hard to find that balance sometimes. And you also don't want to be you know, excessive in the wrong ways and, you know, not accept any kind of responsibility. It's yeah. not like you just get free reign. And you know that we're talking in more extreme cases there, but for the most part, something like a star is born is a pretty, like, that's a pretty easy film to take in terms of like what goes down. It's not like, Oh man, I'm going to have to like, my brain is so fucked for the rest of my life now because of this. It's like, it's a harsh moment, but it's a very real moment. You know, it, 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 it shines a light on a very real problem, a real dilemma. For and the, a movie lot of wouldn't have, the movie wouldn't have been nearly as good without it. I mean, you had to have yeah, it. Precisely. So, and it, I don't it's know. a slippery slope, guys. You can't, you know, it's yep. like that, that, kind, that kind of censorship. I, I, again, I just think it's about processing what we see mm -hmm. and being able to, depending on who you are, where you're at emotionally, what age you are, being able to kind of, process it in a way that's appropriate for you is really what's important. It's not depicting the thing in the first place. That's, that's, it's like, like, don't play limitations on smoking. Talk to your kids about smoking. Yeah. Done. And I mean, it also, it gets kind of scary sometimes too, when it's adults that are complaining about being triggered, you know, I mean, I was, I, I remember when I was in film school, you know, I watched a lot of movies that were upsetting and that apparently have been taken off the curriculum because people would get upset when they would see them. And it's just, you know, at a certain point when you're older like that and you're in university, you need to be challenged at times too with things that you're going to find unpleasant, you know, and it's just, that's to me, that's scary. You know, if everybody, if everything has to be really bland and really safe, because then you're not really making art anymore, right? Right, exactly. Like you, it's, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm upset when I watch movies, uh, or or like Ava DuVernay's new Netflix series. That's yeah, upsetting. Oh, it is upsetting, absolutely. But I think it's important that people educate themselves and see it certainly, and then learn, learn, yes. learn for God's yes. sake. Because <laughs> life isn't fair. Life isn't always fair, and sometimes it's pretty terrible. But at other times, it's great. You know, and that's just that's part of it. That's part of everything. Yep. Well, and I think that's a great what you just said, uh, Gray is you know, learning, it's all of this can be a catalyst to you finding out more information for yourself, you know? So I think yep. in that regard, entertainment can serve as that, you know? So it's Absolutely. a great thing. All right. So last topic we have on deck, Stranger Things 3. Gray, did you, you watch it all the way through? I did actually. <sighs> Okay. Okay. So you guys both watched it all the way through. I don't. I don't know what to do in this case because I don't want to limit your conversation. It is coming out on Friday, a week after uh, after it opened. I mean, if you want, I could kind of maybe give my thoughts and then bail and let you guys discuss the ending of it. I don't. I don't know. Cause I, I don't. I don't want to be ruined though. The ending because I'm watching it probably tonight. So I don't well, want to. I think we it. can. I don't I know. I feel like. It. What do you Let, think? Let's what do, you... do it. Let's do a non-spoilery discussion, and then you guys need to revisit when you both seen it because it, okay. it's. I think there's. Oh, no, no, I've of... seen it. Okay. I've I've seen it top to bottom. So I've. Oh seen no, it. I know you have. So why don't we have a non-spoilery conversation <laughs> okay. if if possible? I don't even know if we can. Let's see if we can do it. <sighs> so I think, I think we can. So um, I'll just say like for I'm me nervous, like Stranger no. Things season <laughs> one I thought was great. Like season one, I think kind of took everybody. I mean, yeah. it became a cultural it, phenomenon, you know, unexpected, yeah, um, totally unexpected. Right. And then season two came out and I was like, it was tough for me to get through season two. I just didn't connect with it. Uh, I, thought it, was fine. it did. I thought it was fine. It wasn't great. But sure. It was, fine. it was fine, but that's what I mean. I didn't, it wasn't like season one where, you know, ultimately like it was so new and fresh and it was just like, Oh wow, this is amazing. Like, I, this is so cool. This is a great thing. And then there was a lot of that in season two, a lot of, but it just felt familiar at that point. You so know, I will say, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, well, no, I was just going to, I was going to say in retrospect, I, I rewatched it. I didn't care for season two at first. And while during the rewatch, I appreciated some stuff they did with character uh, mm -hmm. ultimately it just felt too samesy and yeah. uh, that there that there weren't enough new ideas as far as the demogorgon and all the monsters went it felt very rushed 
Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, and I it, agree. And that was, and I think that's felt, what it was. It felt like yeah. they remade season one in a way. Like and it, it really was, felt like just watching the same thing. I feel like it was only ever intended to be a one-off, and then all of a sudden it had to be a franchise, and they put it out within a year of the original premiering. I think it was smart of them to take closer to two years for this one, even yeah. though the kids look remarkably different now because they've all hit puberty. <laughs> they don't look too far off the mark, but they definitely look older. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I came into season three kind of with lower expectations, and I will say that things started off slow for me uh, mm-hmm. with season three. I was invested um enough that i was like cool with it i thought the it was really moving at a fast pace i don't know if that felt the same for you gray but like the pacing was really fast in yeah. the opening episodes like they were cut into like one new track of music and like going to the next character before you could like even you know there was no like uh they, they didn't take any breaths it was very quick um, and I wasn't quite as into it but then as the episodes rolled on i started to get more invested in what was going on uh, with the the creature and everything like as it was growing and becoming whatever the hell it was uh, I started to get more invested but what I found myself most invested in again this time was the characters like I started yeah, to really too. get to the different characters and their situation their, and what was going down and I was intrigued uh, with the the Russian element that was introduced and kind of their their villainy and it ended up feeling more like an entertaining uh version of the show like rather than trying to push this this mythology this world that they created we didn't really learn anything new i can't tell you one single thing we learned new other than that russians are involved <laughs> but i couldn't really tell you anything new in terms of like what was uncovered in terms of what the upside down is and what this creature is and where it comes from not nothing like that but what it did leave me with was this like completely entertained and engaged, fun, nostalgic kind of adventure summer romp. Like yeah. that's what I ended up pulling out of Stranger Things three, even towards the events that transpire in the ending that we won't say because Chris hasn't seen them. But <laughs> by the end, I was thoroughly entertained. I wasn't intrigued. The mystery had worn off, but I just had a really fun time with it. And I felt the ending, you know, it all just came together in a way that I was like, this is just like a lot of fun. And that's where I, like the speed and the cutting and, you know, the editing uh, all came together for me. So in the end, I really enjoyed Stranger Things 3 and it kind of reinvested me in the show where I, I wasn't so much after season two. I'm really enjoying it, too. I find that definitely I'm gravitating more towards certain characters like this season. I'm really liking Steve Harrington has always probably been my favorite character. I'm really liking Steve Harrington. I'm liking Maya Hawke's character a lot. I think she's yeah, kind of yeah. a breakout. Like she's a really, yes. think, a really like potentially big star. She's great in it. Um, you know, I'm liking Dustin a lot. I'm liking the kids. I'm liking the, the relationship between 11 and Mike, even though Mike's a little bit whiny, I'm liking them all. I, I really liked the relationship between, um, uh, between, uh, uh, Eleven and um, oh, and and uh, Hopper, yeah. Hop, uh, well, no, not Hopper. Uh, Max, Max. I really oh, like them okay. together. I like that kind. Yeah, of yeah. Thing. Like the kind yeah. of the girls. Yeah. yeah, it's fun. It's a great. It's a great discovery for her. Where you know, because she was kind of like, you know, she hadn't really had that yet. So it was cool to see her kind of just basically make friend, make a like a best friend. You know, that's a girl that she can talk about. You know, just basically like girl stuff. You know, like say like guys talk about guy stuff. You know, it's cool to see like you know, her character go through that. I had and very... who, by the way, her friend, she's making a friend that like we, like I had when I was that age who gives terrible love advice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> Just Max dump his is, ass. Oh, my God. Max is the worst. Like she, it's like, this is exactly <laughs> the girl you should never be listening to, but you always want to because she's so fiery and confident and you're oh, yeah. a horrible idea. And I love that. I love that Elle is getting caught up in that. I'm not liking Nancy and Jonathan this season, though. I just find there's nowhere really to go with those characters. They've always, I've always found them kind of boring and more so this season. I don't know how the last two episodes go, but whenever they've come on screen, I've been kind of like, eh. Yeah, I really like, I like her. Uh, I like Natalie yeah. Dyer. I think she's really great. She's just, she's a, she's got a, she's such a distinct look, you know, yeah. and she's just really, she's just a cool, I feel like she just belongs in some other type of movie as well. Like she just got so much potential, but the one thing that I don't that I've have don't quite like about her character as much is that similar to Eleven, it's almost like she uh, her character is like suddenly like she knows everything and can do everything. Like she's like almost like flawless and everything. Like 
there's a point this is kind of spoilery but i'm gonna i'm gonna skirt it where she's shooting a gun and she's just like holding it out right she's just like blasting away like she's been at the range for like forever and i'm just kind of like man when did we ever see her like i mean and she has had she's been in the shit before <laughs> but i was kind of like is she like superwoman now or like what like what's going on here um and the other <laughs> problem that i had with 11 was that and I've, I've heard this from other people too is it seems like she's kind of been like the uh the sudden appearance that just uses her powers to save the day in almost every situation. And I didn't think about it until I started seeing people complaining about it. And I was like, I thought, and I was like, Oh shit, that is true. But maybe because I didn't notice it wasn't that big of a deal for me, but in the end it is true. She does kind of show up and just, she's like saves the day with her powers, like, you know, time and time again. So it'd be nice to see what she does without that. If that were ever to happen. I am very fascinated by your comment uh, about how we didn't learn anything new about the upside down because I just realized how true that is. <laughs> like, 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 literally nothing. Like, if oh you really God. think about it, like we didn't learn jack shit. Like, we saw yeah. like the Russians shooting some. All I know is they're shooting a laser. I don't know what that fucking thing is either. And they're shooting it into the wall. And then creatures are coming out. Okay, that's it. And that's all the explanation we get. Like, other than that, we know that you, two people got to turn a key to turn it off. I'm like, that's it. That's all I learned. <laughs> it's fascinating because what it's making me think about is like, well, why did I have such a great time watching this season? It's and I think, it's, yeah, I think I definitely think it's the characters and it sort of holds true to this. My, my most passionate opinion about sequels, which is that in order to have a successful one, you need to think out the story in a clever enough way that the character that you decided you loved in the last movie is in a new situation that's revealing more about that character. So yeah. that way it feels like a yeah. completely fresh yeah. experience. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. And, and while, I couldn't agree more. Well, I think they do do that pretty well. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's interesting. Cause I don't, I, I wonder if I watch it again, like through that lens, if I would feel like they were entirely, uh, successful in doing that but it had to be the case because the story was so kind of it, it just similar that again yeah. but it worked so much better and I I'm glad that they took longer to make this season I think it really shows and I also think there's only one thing that stood out like a sore thumb and it's in the very first episode and my husband brought it up to me too I just wanted to say this to you and everybody listening just so I could feel better when they're sitting in that car and Hopper is yelling at Mike and <laughs> yeah. Mike, Mike says, you were, you're lying. Like you, you sack of shit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Little, little shit. Yeah. A little right? jerk. And I, w and I was like, listen, listen to me. I yeah. feel like you guys have been through something together and you have fought mobsters. So you obviously feel more comfortable with him than you would the normal chief of police slash dad, dad of your girlfriend. <laughs> But <laughs> yeah. exactly, yeah. I still felt like that was just a little too much. Like it just shocked me so much that I was like, "Did you just put that in there to shock me?" Because I'm very shocked. Yeah, because I feel like I feel like in the real world, you know, we would never talk to our girlfriend's dad that way. I mean, just never. Yeah, and Mike, I mean, and Mike is like, they're they're smart more ass. He's very yeah. casual about it, you know, like he's like, ah, fuck you, man. And kind of like, da, 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 da. and it's just, I don't know. I, don't, I feel like that's not really how it goes with kids in the real world. Well, yeah. because And I there's saw a this... lot of like barging into rooms, you know, and like, <laughs> and they, and as soon as he, bar he barges, like, can we help you? Like, yeah. if my kid talked to me like that, I'd be like, we, what do you mean? Can you help me? Yeah. Do you want to do the dishes? Do you, you want to you go, you want to go like rake? You want to go do some work? Like, yeah, you could help me. Like, I, I, mean, the, I maybe it's just the parenting skills for different people, but I mean, you know, <laughs> I think most parents, if your kid does that kind of stuff when they're like talking back, it's kind of like, yeah, what? <laughs> it's so, so funny. I, yeah, I, I definitely was, there were a couple times I was like, what? And I don't, I think that Mike is way smarter than that, regardless of what a little shit he is. Um, <laughs> Cause I, I love how they, I love how they depicted these kids growing up and becoming teenagers. Like I, I dug that, but I definitely thought that one was too far Um, outside of that. I actually agree with what you're saying about the Nancy Jonathan storyline. Uh, it, it doesn't it didn't do a lot for me this season, but um I do like where they ended up taking it. Ah! I don't I don't think you've seen it yet. And but there is 
I won't say it, but I you'll know it when you see it. And I really appreciated it. Um, and I agree. I agree. I'm, I, I'm with you. I I think the Steve storyline. Uh, he he's one of the best characters on the show, especially because of what's going on with him this season, not going to college. Mm-hmm. And he is, and that is a great character that has grown because yeah, I mean, pretty much everybody hated him in season one. Season two was a little more redemptive, and in this one. He, you can actually like him because he's been through the grinder, you know, like you've you've hated him, you've forgiven him, and now you can actually like him. And I think that is a huge aspect of what made his character work <laughs> so well arc. this season. Yeah, it's an arc. And yeah, I love totally. that. I love that when um uh when Robin goes, uh, how many little children are you friends with? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just that, that makes me hilarious. laugh every time. And she is a great character. Okay. I don't I I kind of feel like I don't want to spoil it. I don't know. I can't remember where it happens, but they have some great moments together and she has oh, a great, yeah, a very genuine uh unfolding of events and an unfolding of uh her persona that I think is great and I think it's something that works very well and I think that it um it, it's something that happens naturally, and I think it's great to just see that happen naturally. So I know that's very cryptic, but you'll know it when you see it. So I'm looking forward to it. That's very good. So anyway, Stranger Things 3. Honestly, between Stranger Things 3, The Art of Self-Defense, and still Avengers Endgame, those are like my three like most entertaining things. And Godzilla as a personal fave. Uh, those have been my, you know, m- the best entertainment I've had uh, watching anything this summer. So I'm it's been a disappointing summer otherwise for me. Gray, what has... what stands out for you this year? Oh man, uh, this the blockbusters summer. the blockbusters have kind of bummed me out. Um they, it's been such a lackluster summer. I'm so sh- I'm truly shocked. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I was, we're mid July was... and this is what we've got. Well, I we do have so... one spot of time in Hollywood coming though. I'm, and Hobbs and Shaw. Those both look like pretty good Those ones. Those could be fun, but Go you ahead. know what's funny? It, as it is the case, as is the case most of the time, I'm always the most surprised by the smallest stuff that wasn't even on my radar because I did really enjoy Godzilla. I felt like literally exhausted when it was done. It was so much, so much cool yeah. monster stuff. That surprises me as being one of the more satisfying movies besides Endgame, which I adored. Uh, I'm surprised how much I loved Far From Home, but one of the best movie going experiences that I had is watching a movie that comes out in theaters this week, which is crawl. Oh, really? Yeah. It's not yeah. even, it's not screening for critics, but you know, that happened with Piranha as well. And Piranha was yeah, great, it's screening so I like that director. Oh, Jimmy, would, L's going, Jimmy L's going to see it. That's not, not screening for us in Montreal. Maybe he already saw it. You saw it in LA. Gray. I, I did. And I was, I love nature gone wrong movies. It's my favorite yeah, genre. I like nature. Gone and, wrong. Man, Alexandra Aja just killed it, man. Like, oh, he, see, I love him. He can be really good at times, though. Yeah. The his, his Hills Have Eyes remake to this day, yeah. I love it. It is. Yeah, me too. Oh, I, I love it. I and think I, love it his, I, think, I love his Piranha remake. Yeah, too. Piranha Double D with Elizabeth. Elizabeth oh, Cowden, no, or not Double D. It's just Piranha with uh, with Elizabeth Shue and uh, Adam Scott. Terrific. Yeah, it's Piranha Fantastic. Double D. That's what oh, the sequel was Piranha Double D. No, and a yeah, sequel that's... terrible. <laughs> what? Yeah, there's Piranha 3D, which is the Alexander Aja one. Call... There... Oh, I didn't know there was. A... Oh, I'm. And stupid. then there's I... and then there's Piranha Double D, which is fucking terrible. Oh, see, I didn't, I didn't realize that was. An... I thought that's what it was called. Like that was they like got... a joke. Yeah, so they got like a hacky director to do like a follow. Oh, uh, I see. I didn't know that. Yeah. So for anyways, the Alexander Aja one, I love. It, Crawl is absolutely fantastic. It's such a well done, effective movie. It's so great, and it makes me like less mad about high tension. <laughs> <laughs> I like uh, I like Kaya Scudelliero a lot. She's a good actress. She's and, fantastic, uh, and, and, she, Barry Pe- and Barry Pepper, man. I'm always like, why isn't Barry Pepper more famous? Yeah, he's good. He's Barry Pepper. He's the sniper in Saving Private Ryan. Battle for Earth. God. <laughs> <laughs> what is? That, don't remind him of that. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so at this point, we usually take some uh, listener questions. We don't have a ton of them because we kind of have like some weird hours today, but we do have a couple. So uh, Philip Barker, he wants to know, uh, what are some of the upcoming movies and films you're all looking forward to reviewing? Once Chris, a, I'm going to go ahead and answer for Chris yeah. and say Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. 
And definitely The Irishman, too, big oh, yeah. time. Oh, great choices, yes. Probably Rambo, Rambo, Last Blood as well, I'm pretty excited for, and, and Joker. Those would be good ones. Yeah. Gray, how I'm about def- you? Well, are actually, you still reviewing? I mean, you're still, you're, you're, you're not actually reviewing now, are you? Are you still doing reviews? I don't. I don't technically review the movies. I just tell various radio stations and uh, TV shows like what's coming out. Mm-hmm. Okay. And but I but those are definitely those are definitely ones I'm really excited for. Once upon a time in Hollywood, I'm dying to see. Yeah, dying. Too. And I can't wait for it. Chapter two. Oh yeah. shit! Yeah. It. Oh man. That. Yeah. It chapter two is like right up there with me. It Rambo. I mean, I want to see Once Upon a Time, of course. That's like a given. I feel like you shouldn't even have to say that. It's a Tarantino movie. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, It and Rambo, I think, are two that I'm like really just genuinely stoked for. Mm-hmm. Like, won't miss them. Like, oh, no yeah. chance that I would miss those in a theater. There's no I, chance. I don't, I don't care like how like lambasted they are by critics if that were the case, which I guarantee they won't be. But I wouldn't care. Like that's uh, it's a critic proof movie in that sense. Like cool. I will be there. Doesn't matter. Also, also Knives Out. Oh yeah, I can't wait to see Knives Out. You guys are alone on that one. Yeah, it's weird that you don't want to see. I I really like Johnson in that mode, and I don't know. I like great. look. I, I mean, it's like I said la- on the last episode. I I love Brick. Uh, I love Looper, but I just don't know. There's something about Knives Out that just feels like it looks like the Brothers Bloom, too, which I liked. So it looks too much like a play, which could work. I mean, here's the thing: Knives Out could be great. I, I could absolutely. It's just the vibe that I get is just like I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> I'm gonna see what Gray Drake and Chris Bumbray say, and then maybe we'll see. All right. See if you guys like it. I don't know. Deal. Um, one other uh, question we have this is our last question um, is from Fadhil, and he wants to know what your favorite Comic Con moment that you've experienced. I've never been Chris, to Comic Con, so Chris gets to sit this one out. Gray, you go first. How many oh Comic Cons have you been to? How many Comic Cons have you done? This year will be my eleventh Comic Con. Damn. And I have had so many amazing moments. It's it's one of my favorite places uh, because of the because of the acceptance and the excitement, and uh, it is some of the best eavesdropping of all time. Mm. It is next to impossible for me to pick one moment, but uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> one of one of my earliest Comic Con moments before I was getting paid to be there, uh, I would go and shoot things for the podcast. Mm. Um, and it was fascinating one year to talk to like a late night creature feature host. Um, and he demonstrated uh, in, a, in something that cannot happen in our current culture and in our, in our conversations about empowerment. Um, he, he decided in the middle of the interview to just vampirize me and just go after my neck in the middle ah. of the interview. Oh my God. What? <laughs> it was so great. Bite it was for real try to bite you yeah he was he was he it wasn't so much like a strong bite and i was oh. we have it all on video and it was thankfully it was one of the funniest things that i'd ever been a part of i didn't feel upset about it at all but it's like what what decision making process was he going yeah. through while i was asking him <laughs> questions? um it was crazy and but there <laughs> <laughs> Only thing I tried to video. do the same thing to Reese Witherspoon and it didn't work out well. <laughs> yeah, I don't think Reese would suffer fools for just one <laughs> second, so that doesn't surprise me. It was let, let me guess, it was when she it was that that movie like what is it Home Again or whatever movie? Yeah, just, just like said? in the middle of the interview, I was just like, I'm gonna bite you now. And, then I just, <laughs> and that was, I was the last we saw of Paul. the hotel. He gets out of jail just soon. Imagine somebody doing <laughs> yeah. like I mean that would be truly the end of your like career. Like that would be the end of my career. I like, I would be done if I did yeah. some shit like that. No, like if I did been... that to Reese Witherspoon, uh, which I wouldn't, but like if I did that, that would be the end of me. I'd be done. But but yeah. not not that creature feature uh, guy. Um, but I I'd have to. I mean, this isn't. It's not even comparable, really. But last year getting to host a Hall H panel, standing up in front of an audience of, you know, Amazing. theoretically 6,000 people and getting to talk about a movie that, you, you know, a, especially a franchise that I really care about and, and with artists that I really love, like Shane Black and 
Keegan Michael Key and Sterling Brown and all these. I mean, so such talent. Uh, Jake Busey was so nice to me, and I, it just really an unbelievable experience. And if also, only it had turned out a bit better, though. What's that? If only it had turned out a bit better, though. The oh, no kidding, right? Well. The other thing that really impressed me was I thought that the audience got up and asked very good questions. Mm -hmm. And I was so proud of everyone. It was just that was the one of the coolest things for sure. So let me let me ask you an insider question here. Um, before you did the panel, did they like how much planning is involved prior to you getting oh, up well. and hosting? Like, do they set you down and show you all the footage and like get your reaction and do all that stuff like prior to it? Or is it like, you know, half hour before everything goes down and this is it? Yeah, there's a lot of planning. There's a lot of planning. They definitely don't want it. It's certain for I think for certain properties and for certain sizes of audiences, uh, they really don't want things to go sideways. And so they, there's a lot of planning involved. There's a lot of people in a lot of meetings. And the most important part is getting to talk to the, if, if present, the directors. Yeah. You know, because they're kind of guiding everything. So Shane Black and I got to sit down and kind of chat. And, you know, he was telling me about everybody. Like, if I didn't know some of the panelists, he'd tell me about their personalities. And we, we kind of talk about things that interested me that I wanted to kind of throw into the conversation. And, mm. he, you know, it was it was helpful because we didn't go through it verbatim, of course, but we did just get a sense of how it was going to go. And and, I, you know, the, then you have to make the suits comfortable, too. So, yeah, of course. So are you in you're like currently doing those meetings now for Terminator? Yeah. So, the, so you're it's like the in the midst of that. It's the same thing. Yeah. And they, um, uh, it's the same thing for, for that conversation too, because it's, they haven't announced, um, who else is going to be there, but I know who's going to be there. <laughs> oh, she. And, and so I, when I got the list, I was like, oh yeah, there's going to be a lot of meetings. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I can only imagine. I mean, I, I'm I'm just talking to uh, the Paramount rep, just trying to secure interviews and stuff. So, I mean, my my piece is smaller, but yeah, it's uh, you definitely get a you get a taste for that for you know, kind of the behind the scenes, just talking to them and getting a feel for it. And what I, I imagine how crazy that is. What I imagine, what I what I think is the most the most fun part about all these things is being able to navigate that world of, of making the people in charge of the event comfortable, but at the same time, letting them know that like the, you know, you can't tell me every question to ask. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I have to, I've got the reason that people have me do these things is because they want a sort of off the cuff style. Yeah. And so, so it's like you kind of always have to walk the line. Like you don't want people to think that you're going to go off script and not, you know, at the same time, you don't want to be boring and just a slave to the machine, especially pertinent for the Terminator franchise. So. Right. <laughs> well, and you're also, you're also, you know, a personality and this is what you do. So you also have to uphold your own standard too. Like you have to be you. You can't just go out because people would expect like, you know, Gray Drake to be Gray Drake. They don't want you to yeah. come out there and be like, they'd be like, why was she so like cold and icy? And, you know, she's usually very fun and crazy and has like a fun outfit. So, sure. Do you have an outfit picked out for this already? Um, you know what? I don't like to wear costumes to lead panels like that because I what? think that so you're not going to be an endoskeleton. <laughs> I know if you can believe that. Um, I just like Predator last year. While I wore something that I thought was sort of like it, sort of like kind of whispered to the the style of the movie. Um, I think ultimately it's just distracting. And at the end of the day, it's not about me. It's about all the people that are on the panel and you want people paying attention to them. And, and so my, my number one rule for everything I've ever done is does it feel right? And do, am I a hundred percent in on this? And if there's, if I'm at 99.9, that's not enough. Yeah. Like I yeah. need to be fully sold on what I want to do because that's the only reason I get away with so much is because I believe in what I'm doing and I know that it's in service to promoting the film. And if it doesn't, if, if it's very funny, but it doesn't feel right, then I'll just save it for my notes and yeah. maybe someday it'll feel right. But I, you know, it's ultimately 
people watch my videos certainly to some extent because I'm hosting them, but all, mostly because of who I'm speaking to. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't, don't have, ever. Yeah. I just don't want to be disrespectful or, or weird in any way. I'm weird enough. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, so you're not going to do telekinesis with the uh, panelists for Terminator Dark Fate? <laughs> we, we will not be doing any kind of psychic interviews, no. I mean, though, um, that is that is a legit funny uh, interview, though. I, did, thank, I thought that was really funny. Thank you. Well, because I figured it's like, well, yeah, mutant abilities, right? But for, for Terminator, uh, it's it's like, oh, no, this is like a little bit more. This is actually, and also it's just a, there's a little bit less room to have fun. Yeah, because um, it's not exactly uh, there's just something about the property. There's not a, not as much jokey stuff that I feel like I could get away with. So it's that's true. I mean, because it's a pretty I mean, it's like a violent kind of sci fi. You can come out with like a knife hand or, you know, <laughs> a 40 mic mic grenade and just fire it into the crowd. You know, well, I think that's gonna happen. It's not, probably not going to go over too well. So there's only, only actually... so much you can do. Hey, can you make your eyes glow red, though? <laughs> Or just have. <laughs> what if Gray just came out and just had glowing red Terminator eyes? That would fuck up. In the, like, what? what's, what's the ball that the Terminator travels in? To... Yeah. Oh, fuck. That's how you should. Yeah. You need to work that's, that in. That's how you should show up. That's super funny. But I, 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 I need your be, clothes, your boots, and your motorcycle. That's another, another thing you have to consider. <laughs> These so. are these are these are these are great suggestions. We've done some great work here today. Yeah, we should, <laughs> should be consulting team. <laughs> uh, Jesus, it. please don't bring Paul and Chris into the meeting again. <laughs> Sick of hearing their shit. <laughs> 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 well, uh, that about does it for us, guys. Um, Gray, it was a treasure having yes. you on the show today. Yeah, it was I a lot of fun. You- for coming on and offering your insight and giving us uh, some Miss Movie Phone info and uh, for us being able to introduce you to those yeah. that may not be aware of you. I think that's Thank you, uh, Thank you very much for coming on. Definitely. Thank you for having me. This was a lot of fun. You guys are the best. Are you going to be a TIFF? I certainly hope so. We've been t- we've been talking about it, and I think it's such a great festival. So hopefully we'll, well be able hopefully to. I'll, hopefully I'll see you there. Hopefully we'll get to grab a coffee. Nice. A if Tim I Hortons. don't get to a run double, into double at Tim Hortons. Oh, yes. Shit. If I don't run into a Comic Con, I will certainly. You can be rest assured I will be in the crowd for Terminator Dark Fate, and I'll scream out your name. Maybe I'll sing out our song. <gasps> well, your song that I made for you. Once you oh come my out. God. Oh, I love it. Yes, incredible. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so great. Where can people find you now? So my personal account is my name. So it's G R A E D R A K E Gray Drake, and then you can find uh, the Ms. Movie Phone Show loading on Fridays on our Facebook, Twitter, and uh, YouTube accounts. And that's just movie phone with an F the way the good Lord intended. (laughs) Uh, Awesome. And then uh, if you guys want to catch us, of course, if you're listening to this now, uh, you know that you can uh, catch us on YouTube, blog, talk, radio, iTunes, uh, and we also ask, please, uh, to help spread the word, go give us a review on iTunes. Again, we don't you don't need to write a whole book report just like we like this show and give us five stars. It helps immensely to do that. That would be wonderful. And if wonderful. you don't like it, then keep it to yourselves. <laughs> keep that one asshole that gave us one star because you didn't like what I had to say. Well, I hate your uh. face. And <laughs> thanks. But still, hey, honestly, it still helps. If you guys, if you, if you really feel that strongly, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, it, it will help just to get uh, the word out but we do appreciate you guys listening um, and uh, for all those that participated in the giveaway last week uh, we will be uh, making selections this week so that Pet Cemetery signed 4K and Forrest Gump will be heading out to you guys uh, very soon so anyways wow, Forrest Gump signed? no the Pet Cemetery mm, sorry, sorry. Forrest Gump's just Forrest Gump. You just have to enjoy it. Like a box of chocolates. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so that does it for us this week. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you again, Gray, for joining us. Uh, it was wonderful to have you. And we will see you guys next week. Bye.